What's up, everybody? Metal Dave here, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster, bringing you another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. Today, we are joined by super producer Max Norman. What a career this guy has had. You know his work, whether you know it or not. He, of course, did Blizzard of Oz, Diary of a Madman, uh, Jason's first album with Dangerous Toys, Dirty Looks Cool from the Wire, Megadeth's Euthanasia, Megadeth's Countdown to Extinction, Armored Saints, Delirious Nomad, the list goes on and on and on. Y&T's Black Tiger, I didn't even get to ask him about that. Uh, he's done a couple of records with Loudness. We barely touched on Loudness. Uh, but man, when the career is that long and he's got that many stories, you won't get to it all in one episode. Uh, it's a long one, but we tried to get everything we could and his stories were great. It was kind of one of these uh, Talk Louder episodes where... Don't get me started because I can't shut up about it. Um, I, I I will give the disclaimer and the full on warning. I'm interrupting Max the whole episode, so just get ready <laughs> to hear me uh, interrupt everyone all the time in this episode. And it's mainly because I get excited and I'm a fan, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, and um, you have history with them. Yeah, and we and we have respect, and it, it's exciting, and so there's that. And uh, Dave, your questions were were spot on, but I feel like he was already answering your questions before you answered them because he was such a great uh, guest and talker, and has so much knowledge, and uh, just super fun to hang out with and yeah. to work with and uh, I have great nice mem guy. yeah great memories and I learned a lot from uh and he's legendary to to boot that's not you wouldn't think about it you hear the name Max and and you meet the guy he's just a guy you know but you go oh shit you're Max Norman you produce that that's kind of a uh the vibe I get but it's that was my impression yeah I, I I know his background I know his history I know he's a legend and and a master of his craft and then he gets on camera and starts talking and I feel like I'm talking to you know one of my buddies at the rock show yeah it's just a down-to-earth guy uh great talker a lot of great stories but I didn't feel one bit of intimidation or starstruck yeah. or whatever because he's not that kind of person yeah. So, so the next time uh, our listeners and people watching on YouTube, uh, the next time you uh, hear Crazy Train, our Which guest is about the, five seconds. Our, our guest is the guy <laughs> uh, that's that placed all those microphones and was hanging out in the studio with the great late Randy Rhodes, Bob Daisley, Lee Kerslake, and one Ozzy Osbourne. Here on the Talk Louder podcast today, we have Max Norman. There you are. There he is. Man, you look exactly the fucking same. <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I look I look much older. Well, isn't that's it, okay. It, aren't I supposed to say something spectacularly ridiculous when you see an old yeah. friend? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all the uh, you know, the, the, the false bonhomie is what they call it. Well, there's a story. <laughs> the, fake, the fake bonhomie. I have oh, a story. Dude, it's so great to see you. I, I have a I have a Max story that I want to tell but this is Dave. Dave. Hey, Dave. Hey, Max. Nice yeah. to see you, man. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. Dave oh, is well, the any, any time. Well, not any time, but you know, yeah. sometime. <laughs> Dave, Dave is the real journalist here, and I'm just the the fanboy. So, listen. Ah, but you're probably the guy with the intrinsic knowledge, Jason. Oh That's no, Dave is just a fucking nerd as I. But here's oh, the really? here's the deal. Oh my god. And then yeah, here it is. Check it out. Here's my here's my story that fits my my false hello a second ago. <laughs> is you my fault my shit compliment so you told us a story it was like you know at we were hanging at the studio and i've re i've remembered this uh, forever <laughs> uh be it so long ago you said you you were backstage after iron maiden played and bruce dickinson walked in and you you remember yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and you said yeah, great show yeah. mate you said great show and he was like fucking bollocks that was crap <laughs> I sang like shit. Fuck off! Like uh, he may have not as 
been uh, as colorful as that, but yeah. Oh, he was even more colorful than oh, that shit. because that, because at the end of that whole thing, you maybe you didn't remember this, but what he said to me was, "Wouldn't have you as my producer." Oh. You're fucking kidding! <laughs> <laughs> well, no wonder you remember that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I looked fuck. at him. I, I, my fucking blood ran cold, man. Oh. <sighs> Yeah, but you know, on off screen and on another time, I'll tell you how I got my own back, which I did. But but we won't get into that right no, now. No, it's un it's unnecessary, <laughs> Max. It's fucking great. It's great to see you. Yeah, yeah, it's great to see you too. And Jason, before we move on, I just want to mention. I know you had a, you lost a few people this year or last year or in, recently, and I just wanted to express my condolences. You know. Uh, a lot of my people have gone too, and you know we're losing people all the time. I'm really sorry to hear it, man, and I, I'm glad to see that you're in reasonable spirits. And you know you gotta, you know you gotta move towards the future always, of course. You know. Yeah, and thanks for saying that. That Dave, that'll tell you what kind of man we're talking to today. And yeah, you know, yeah. Dave is in the same boat. We have a lot of the same friends, and you know, ner nerds hang out together. So what the <laughs> fuck? So <clears throat> yeah, no thanks for saying out with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, well, especially mom, mom's nerds, basement. You know. They know That's what we're into. Show, Max. Mom, mom's basement. They don't hang out with people like us because we're fucking hoarders, you know. No, no, <laughs> I like it. I like the background. It looks really cool. You know, I tried. You know, I always try. Did you see? Did you note my facetious remark to your to your email? I, I responded we already. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. did you? Yeah. Oh, I didn't read it. No, nah, don't, okay. don't worry. It's not as good as yours. No, no. Oh, well, no, yeah. no. <laughs> no, no. Actually, I could have made mine better, but I didn't think about it enough. I just fired it off quick because I was rushing around trying to get the camera in the right fucking place. You know? Yeah, fuck it. Don't worry about <laughs> it. You look great, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Well, I just turned se I turned seventy like last year, so ah. <laughs> so I'm, co I'm coming up. Yeah. I'll be seventy-one. Yeah, in a few months. So we should all look as good at seventy. Yeah, well, you know, it, nothing to do with me. My living in the past has not contributed to my. To my well-being in the future by any means but i gotta say uh i have very i had very good genes i was very lucky so it's, it's all just a fucking lucky really where are you guys located these oh days? i'm i'm in i'm in orlando now i just moved down here about uh, oh i moved down here last may from uh from up upper east side manhattan which i've been in for Oh, I don't know. Since twenty fourteen, maybe so. Okay, I don't know, ten, you, almost almost ten years, like eight, eight nine years. You've moved around a bit since we were hanging out. Where were yeah. you, Where were you living in eighty nine ish? Oh, oh, okay. So when I was working with you, when we did uh, 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 the album, when I did the album with you. Um, I was living in New York. Okay. And I was flying. I, I was actually left from, I, 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 I remember, I think I left you guys to go to Japan to do loudness. I think that's yeah. what happened because I was with Celine and she was helping yeah. me buy suitcases. But uh, yeah, so at that right. point I was, I was living in New York. 1990, I moved to LA because I did, started to do lynch mob and that took fucking months and months and months, and in in the process, we kind of we kind of decided to move. At, at New York wasn't very good at, in 1990. It was kind of funky and fucked mm. up. So, so we moved to LA in 1990. And, okay. Uh, then I moved back to New Jersey, which I did not want to move to, but it was great for the kids. I had kids then. Okay. So right. I had kids kids when I was in LA. Right. And figured, okay, well, better better go somewhere where there's good schools. Mm. So moved back to and, and that was and then grunge happened as well. So it was like a double whammy of like <laughs> kids, kids grunge. grunge. <laughs> Fuck, I need a new job. So kids. actually what happened was <laughs> that's actually what happened was I got a new job, actually, is what is what happened. Is I right. got a job as a as a chief information officer at a big a New York company. I, I think, sound like fucking Skunk Baxter or some kind of shit, like rocket science. Well, yeah, 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 because he <laughs> works for the government. 
Yeah, he, he, does. he worked, used to work for Skunk Works, and he used yeah. to, I don't know, he's a fucking JPL and all that shit. Yeah. yeah. Which is so, very cool stuff. So <laughs> listen, yeah, I agree. So listen, uh, we can jump, we can do whatever we want. We can jump all over the place. But you mentioned Lynch Mob. Uh, Lynch Mob was after you went and did Loudness in Japan. This would have been 89 is Yeah, 90. yeah. Like, yeah, and then Lynch Mob was 1919. There's a whole there's okay. a whole big story about that because what just came out recently, you probably, I don't know if you saw it, but they were a uh, Phil and Selma was talking about Pantera, uh-huh. and the fir- and the first record which I was gonna do. Cowboys, and then he, he, you were gonna do Cowboys? Yeah, yeah, Far yeah. Out. yeah. Wow. And it's an interesting. It's a real long story, and you know, I was, I was talking to. Um, a couple of people called me out and it said, dude, you bailed on it. And I'm like, well, Uh-oh. I went, I went to do lynch mob actually. Oh, so wow. the thing, okay. So, but I, you know, I don't know. It's, well, a, wait, it's it kind of been, a long story. It wouldn't have been Cowboys. It would have been uh, the second record, vulgar display of power. Is that correct? No, no. First, first record. Oh, this, Cowboys. Well, okay, here's, here's what happened. I got a call from Derek at Atco, right? Yes. Um, the, the guy from general giant, Derek, uh, uh, can't remember the second name. Yeah, anyway, that's okay. he, he he called me up. He goes, listen, I got this band down in Texas. You got to go down and see them, and tell me what tell me what's going on. So I went down there. It was Pantera. I'm, it's a tiny little bar. I I sit at the bar. I can see through the bar to the stage right here. It's a it's a little place. A band comes out. They just and they start doing fucking cowboys. Yeah. And my the, all the fucking hairs go up on the on every hair that I had stood up. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm like, oh fuck, yeah, you know. So I, I was like, just sat there and had a few drinks and enjoyed the show. And the show was fantastic. And th- at that point, the fucking band was just fucking raw oh, and oh, and just just fucking this this whole magic thing. Hungry. So I was like, I was like, oh shit, yeah. I mean, the whole thing, you know, dying back, you yeah. know, the whole thing, yeah. man. Yeah. The whole thing was just fucking all put together. So I go, dope. Dude, totally. Yeah. So we have a few drinks afterwards. We have a few shots, blah, blah, blah. I go back to New York and I said to Derek, you got to sign this man. Mm-hmm. So he goes, he goes, yeah, I want to sign the band. I said, he said, I think the band's great. I want you to produce the band. He said, I'll sign them if you produce it. So I go, okay, look, here's the deal. At that point in time, when the industry was different from what it is now, you had to, as a producer, I needed certain things to be in place before I would do a project for self-preservation and to make sure the project was worthwhile and would get source support, fucking, you know, support from the record company. So you need a couple of things. You need, you need a contract with the record company at that point in time. You need management. Very important. If you don't get management and you make the record, as soon as they get management, they want to change the record. So there's no point in doing the record if they if they don't have management in place that's going to stick with them. So these I learned these things the hard way, real hard way, you know, mm-hmm. after many years. So I go, okay, look, you got to we've got to get them a management, and then I can then we can look at it, you know. So Andy Gould, who you know, who was my manager at the time, mm-hmm. I said, Andy. This fucking band is happening. You better manage this band. He goes, okay. So he became the manager, him and Walter O'Brien, I think. Mm-hmm. At the mm-hmm. time, they were doing concrete, you know, or they just post concrete or whatever. You remember those guys. Yep. Anyway, uh, so we started to get everything in place. Uh, Atco, sign him up. In the meantime, I'm getting replies from George over on the West Coast uh, with Lynch Mob. Yeah. And I've been trying I've been trying to make a record with George for a couple of years before this and it never really came around and now he sent me a couple of things and I'm like wow this stuff is you know this stuff is great too. So now I'm in this quandary <laughs> and it's a fucking you know it's a fucking drag actually. So I'm like oh, fuck. So I'm like George you got to move you got to wait. No, he ain't going to wait. I go, okay, <laughs> fucking us Pantera. Okay, guys, you got to wait. No, they ain't going to wait. I'm like, fuck. So it comes down to actually 
quite small things have become deal breakers at this point. Um, mm. So what happened was they wanted to do it down at Vinny. Vinny, Vinny wanted to do it at his home studio. No, I'm, I'm not going to walk into some like a, like a little, you know, a hut with a 16 track or something. No, I'm not going to do it. It, it, it. it could be a disaster waiting to happen. I could spend more time fixing stuff than recording. It could be, it could be a, a nightmare. And I'm like, no, I, I'm not going to do that. It would take too long. I don't think we get the best result. We need to do it in a, in a, in a decent place where we can work fast and I know what I'm doing and I got the right console. So if any, we didn't want to change that. So nobody was being flexible. So at that point, I'm like, it came down to actually 30 grand to do, <laughs> to do Pantera and 50 grand to do Lynch Mob and all the other things. And I, the thing was, I didn't, I couldn't say to Vinny, dude, I'm not doing it in your shitty little studio. I mean, I can't say that to the guy. No. So I'm like, you know, so I'm like, I can't even say I'm not doing it because of your studio. And that's really the reason. Mm. So I go, fuck, guys, I, look, if you want to know the truth, they're giving me more money. So I made that the reason because okay. I didn't want to be a cunt. I didn't want to be a total cunt to Vinny. Yeah. So they don't know that. And I never really told them that. Well, they, but I really, they I do really, now. really want to. Yeah, well, they do now, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really, really didn't want to do it with them. I fucking love the band. We uh, we got everything set up. I, I was instrumental in getting, in, in getting, Derek will tell you, Derek, uh, uh, you know, yeah. um, at, at Acker, well, it's not Acker, in Atlantic, but, you know, he'll tell you. There's a guy from General Giant, one of the two guys from General Giant that went to Acker, but, you know, we were instrumental in getting them signed. We were instrumental, got them management. Like we, we got everything in place for them. And then I had to, then I couldn't do it. Wow. And then it was like, so it was like fucked up. Well, and I think it took like, took like eight months. Fuck. But anyway, just, I'll just to cut a long story fucking short. I, Terry Day got to do them. He was a perfect guy for them. He kept yeah. doing the records. He made great records. So I thought everything worked out fine. Fuck <laughs> it, the end result. Yeah, they did fine without you, bro. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you know what? He might have been a better guy to do it too. So, you know, fine. Yeah, they, that, that's a great story. They Rico. figured, <laughs> yeah, they they figured it out. I feel like it's fairly exclusive too. I don't know how many people know that backstory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's an interesting story. And I, I actually, I'll tell you who called me out on it was the uh, the comedian. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Don Jameson. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, because <laughs> he's, he's kind of a friend of mine, or an acquaintance of mine, or a friend mm -hmm. of mine. And uh, mm -hmm. I went on his show, and uh, he actually texted me. I guess when Phil, when Phil did ten things you didn't. It was one of those ten things you didn't know about Cowboys from Hell. Wow. Okay. So that was I think number three. You know. Okay. Far Norman out. Okay. Ba Norman bailed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it almost sounds like Norman Bates. Yeah, I know. It's, a, it's, it's like a fucking horror show thing, man. Wow. What a, what a fucking, what a bastard. I can't even believe you were so, such an asshole. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to check. Is this working right? This this is the right? Yeah. You sound great. We hear you fine. You sound great. I got the Lavalier. Le yeah, you yeah, do. It's yeah, you do. fine. So Listen, speaking of, yeah, speaking yeah, of uh, before we move on, Dave, hold the yeah. thought, hold the thought, because uh, I have a feeling Max has given us plenty of his time today. Um, listen, no, no, I got I got plenty of time. That's we what I'm saying. Yeah, I think that we're going to hang, hang out and have a great time. Uh, so when is your birthday? You mentioned your birthday is coming up. Oh, May the 30th. May, so okay, I'm, May, all yeah. right. I'm a, Be, I'm a Gemini, and I think your birthday's in May, isn't March. it? March. No. Oh, is Ma it? Oh. March, yeah, so it's coming up oh, right you're up. Like a, you're like a cancer or something. Uh, Pisces, according to Zodiac, oh. but I think that they got the Zodiac calendar wrong, and I could be an Aries. So listen. Oh, yeah, I had no idea about any truth, of that shit. Some truth anyway. to that hippie shit, actually. So anyway, listen, uh, <laughs> There's a the reason I, 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 pond, I, I ponder the birthday comment is because there's a photograph that, we, that I scanned, and it's going to be in the montage that we do in the intro when we kick you out at the end and talk shit about you. 
Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a bunch of photos here. I don't want to give them all away. Oh, oh I sent them to you already. That's right. You've already seen them. Though it's the one with the birthday yeah. cake. It's the one with the cake. Yeah, it's this one with oh. the cake. Right? It's the cake. Oh, we're, we're, uh, yeah, uh, what that yeah. was not in May, so it wasn't your birthday. I wonder whose fucking birthday it was. You got me, buddy. Because we're sitting in Sound City in the con fucking control room with a cake. You and Scott and Bruce, the, Bruce, the uh, the second engineer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we're sitting in there just to explain the picture to our listeners and not our watchers. Uh, <laughs> and you're pointing at the cake like we're about to eat all of this cake right now and get the <laughs> yeah, heavy, heavy sugar buzz. Uh, to take care of whatever is hanging over, and yeah. um, I can't recall. I thought, it, I thought it. I thought it was a shame. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, I thought fine. it was a shame that we didn't. None of us got asked about to be in that Sound City uh, film. Mm. They, they, and I, I made a bunch of uh, you know that whole. Everybody's in that. Yeah, but the yeah. Re the real guys aren't in there. I did loudness there. I did you guys there. I mean, yeah. Hello. Yeah, I don't Hello. know. I don't know. They did. It's all. Uh, it's it's all Stevie <laughs> Nicks. <laughs> it's yeah. Nirvana and Fleetwood Mac and and yeah, Jesse's uh, girl. Jesse's star girl. Qual yeah. Star quality. There yeah. you go. <laughs> mm. They yeah. gave time to Dio. <laughs> yeah, they didn't even have yeah. enough Dio in there for me. So anyway, uh, yeah, I don't I don't remember whose birthday it was because those months that we spent there, if I recall, were from like. End of October, November, December, break for Christmas holidays, came back in January, finished up a few things, and then sayonara. Yeah, what well, was January, what, 89? It would have been January 89 that we were finishing that up and saying, help, saying see you later. Yeah, sounds about, sounds about right. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know whose birthday it would have been in, because Mark's birthday, Mark Gary's birthday is in May as well, I believe or August, something like that. So I don't know. And, and Scott's is in, is in March as well. So I don't know. Fuck knows. Yeah. Fuck no. Dave, take maybe, it away. Dave, maybe, what do you, what do you maybe got, it Dave? was a, maybe it was somebody at the studio's birthday. There Could you be. go. Maybe it yeah. was Stevie Nick's birthday and we stole the cake. <laughs> 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 Fucking Stevie. I'll tell you, I, there's a few stories I can tell you about Stevie Nick's as well. Oh, because shit. I was at I <laughs> I was at the record plant, the old record plant before it moved, uh, that was next door to the Entourage restaurant, and I I was there mixing Black Tiger with the wine tea. Oh yeah, kick ass! And and the second in studio, there's four studios there. It's Studio Two. They were mixing Boston. In Studio Three was wow. Fleetwood Mac. Wow. And no, Studio Four was Fleetwood Mac, and Studio Three was Kiss. Wow! So the fucking play, the place was fucking great. You know, yeah. you you know what it's like when yeah. you got more than one band around. You know, oh, and that, yeah. that place, that place was incredible. Yeah, but uh, there's a lot of stories about Stevie in, in the jacuzzi late at night, and oh, you know shit. all that kind of stuff. I don't <laughs> oh, want to get explicit no. because because I'll get sued probably. Right. Well, <laughs> it sounds like a lot of people were having fun. Yeah, it was. Yeah. You know, we, we about five o'clock, there would be a knock on the door and everybody would go next door to this restaurant called The Entourage. Okay. And it would just be full. I mean, there'd be fucking Gene would be in there. There'd be, you know, Rod Stewart was in there one day. It was fucking just full of fucking stars. <laughs> and everybody everybody avoiding buy, buying anybody else a drink, you know, it was that kind of deal. Well, I remember another story. This is a Max Norman story that this uh -oh. would, wouldn't have anything to do with any of the people that you mentioned other than maybe Rod. Y you would, you would call it peeling an orange in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. And well, Dave, to explain that to Dave, do you want to explain that so Dave knows what that means? <laughs> and everyone yeah, tell I, the story. I think it's a, I think it's a Scottish um, okay. term. Actually, but um, uh, well, it, it actually came about right from that point when I when I was in the entourage with Russ Stewart there, and I noticed how he was getting bought a lot of drinks, but he never ever bought anybody a drink, and it's because I think he was very poor when he was very young, mm. and a lot of these kind of guys, you know, when they when they get a lot of money, they kind of you know they they they're kind of. Kids.
keep it close careful. to their chest, let's careful. say. Yeah, careful. So anyway, anyway, so the Scottish term for that is he peels an orange in his pocket, meaning that he – and you know how hard that is, obviously. So, But he peels it in his pocket, so you don't know he's got an orange and you don't get any. So he doesn't have to share it. Right, right. So it's, it's – So it's it, – it, being being a miser, a mean mean yeah. person, a being a miser is really what it means. Yeah, but the <laughs> the un the un not as cool version of that is oh fuck, I left my wallet in the car. Can you get this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there so. were there were the hundreds of versions, yeah, over the years, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! Oh fuck! They only take cash. <laughs> Shit's real. But that one's got. <laughs> that one caught me out before, yeah. Fucking cash bar, yeah. You love that one when you just what, got a fucking what year twenty was, credit card. What year was that? Uh, that all that shit was going on. That you know, Fleetwood Mac and Rod Stewart, and you were doing you were doing Black Tiger Y and T. What year was that? That got to be like around eighty two, eighty three, okay. somewhere yeah, around there. All right. So Kiss would have been I'm making maybe eight, eighty three. I'm thinking Kiss would have been doing Lick It Up. I think. Probably yeah, probably yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. And wow, Boston, it was it was the first big first. I think it was the first, maybe the second Boston album. But yeah, I remember yeah, not the John first. Boyle, not the no, first. No, John Boston. Boylan was in there, and Paul Grupp was mixing, and uh, oh yeah, that was it, it was all fuck. It was a star-studded fucking place, you know. Boston. And every day I went, and it was great, you know. Yeah, I think it might have been "Don't Look Back." record maybe boston yeah it was the early 80s it was not yeah. the first. Yeah. yeah yeah and uh fleetwood mac were in there for forever well, and there's, yeah. a, there's actually a, there's actually a really good story about that and I, I don't know if it's really true but those machines there uh were 3m uh, 3m two inch 24 track uh analog machines and they had this thing called an iso loop where it went around like this the tape and that transport was very susceptible to tensioning, so uh, they those those machines weren't particularly very good machines. Uh, they were fairly robust, but they did need quite a lot of tinkering. And there's this story about Fleetwood Mac were in their studio D, I think, and they had so many problems with the tape machine. But every time the the guy came in to fix the tape machine, uh, it it, it behaved normally. So what they eventually did is they got a bunk bed in there and said the guy the guy just had to stay in there all the time. Wow. Because when the guy was in there, the fucking thing didn't go wrong. So they basically just paid the guy to be in there all, and, and sleep in there. Man, that's good and work. I, I don't know if that's a true story, but it, it's a cool story. Though. That's good work that's if you can get gig. it. <laughs> <laughs> a bit fucking boring, but, you know, yeah. maybe, you get a, maybe you get to do a few fucking gang vocals. Who knows? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, Max, I have to hey, ask brother. you. Um, I, I'm a I'm a huge Randy Rhodes fan, and uh, obviously, you spent some some time with Randy and and cut two two great records with Randy, and then continued to work with Ozzy. Uh, my question is: When you were working on the Blizzard of Oz record, I understand it started with Chris Sangiardis or however you put it. Sangridis. Tangerides, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tangerides, yeah. And then, uh, for some reason, Ozzy wasn't happy with how things were going, so the album was handed over to you to produce. Yeah, you know, it was well. It, I'm going, okay, so let me correct that. Overall, that's kind of basically true. Is basically what was happening was we just finished building the studio. We just put in this new SSL. It was a second E series SSL in England. Oh, D series. I'm sorry. So this was like. The, and, and these these consoles changed the recording industry up after this point. The first one was over at the Manor in Oxford, which was Virgin Records uh, Studio, uh, and we got the second one. And we were very it was a lot of money, and we were very intent on making sure that everything worked great. So anyway, Chris comes in, and uh, he was very uh, first of all he put the drums down in a, in the drum room. Well, purport, it's, he called it the drum room, but it's really not a drum room. It's got a seven foot ceiling and it's square and it's concrete. So it's mm. like actually probably the worst place to put a fucking drum unless it's just one drum. Yeah. You know, so he put Lee down there and uh, of course he started playing and everything was okay till he started hitting the cymbals. 
And then it was just like, yeah, you know, it was, it became uh, just, just fucking over the top stuff. So, uh, you know, obviously going for the old Phil Collins, you know, kind of, you know what I mean? Stone room vibe, but, uh, there's a lot better ways to do that, and especially is not not putting it in a shitty room, you know, because that's a bad room to to put it in, you know. So that was the first thing, which which wasn't working very well. So um, I was kind of horrified by what was coming out of the speakers. So what I what I suggested to Chris was, why don't you go down on the studio floor and like you know chat to the guys, you know. And all that kind of stuff, because I could tell he was kind of a little, kind of a bit new with production stuff as well. We're both, we're all young guys at this point, you know. So I say, what? So anyway, I, he goes, "Yeah, good idea." So he goes down there. I close the, I close the control room door, turn off the headphones. I can rebalance it real quiet, rebalance the headphones a little bit, and then just sort of sit back again because he was doing the engineering. <laughs> So I'm like, fuck it. I turned down the fucking room. I turned down the fucking overheads. You know, I'm like, okay, now now I can tell what the fucking drums are doing, actually. Because I couldn't tell before. You know, it was like, it was it was out of, really out of whack. So, mm. uh, to me, anyway. Yeah. So anyway, they came up and they, they came in. They're like, oh, well, have a listen. You know, so they have a listen. They're kind of, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, so moving forward, moving forward. And after a couple of days of doing this, uh, I I just I I thought I, I I actually thought he will get it you know he'll be he'll go well, yeah but what Chris would do is at the start of almost you know regularly about every fifty minutes he'd just pull all the faders down and then rebalance it mm-hmm. and that to me that's like if you've taken like half an hour to get a decent balance that to me that that's just doesn't make any sense well, you know what what are you going to start again now you know I mean, you just make incremental changes, like to me anyway. But okay, so I figured he would get it. He didn't get it. Eventually, I stopped doing it. So obviously, the the change he would he wiped out the mix. He put up his mix. They came in. They looked at each other, and they silently filed out of the room. So I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you know. And mm-hmm. I don't want this to happen. I don't, you know. I figured he would get it, but it's like he didn't get it at all. Right. So I'm like, mm. oh, oh. So I'm like, oh, this sounds this sounds bad. So anyway, then they call Chris and he disappears and goes to talk to them. And then about half an hour later, Ozzy calls me over to one of the uh, one of the houses in the compound, you know. And he goes, hey, you know, do you want to, you know, Chris? He said that guy doesn't fucking get it, does he? And I'm like, I'm so well, I don't think he does. I was, I'm sorry, no. You know, because I'm not going to fucking bullshit. Right. And it, mm. I, I don't mean to. I don't mean to be an asshole, but it's like, look, everybody's on the line here. Make it sound good or get away. You know. Yeah. If it ain't sounding good, you you know somebody's got to own up. And do to me, it that, just wasn't. It, do you think it just that, wasn't sounding good? Do you think that going when you come into a, a project that's kind of already started and and you're and you're in the situation that you're describing right now. Do you think it has to do with preference? I mean, or, well, or, 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 yeah, it's your opinion over another producer's opinion. It, 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 and, and, but the band ultimately has to be happy. I mean, I know the fucking answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, obviously now this, this is an interesting question, Jason, because this yeah. is a question from a, from a producer to a p- producer. And actually, all you're doing is checking that you're doing the right thing. And you know the answer already is, look, if you know, you say. If you don't know, you don't say. But mm-hmm. if you hear it and it's bad, you say. Yeah. Because what people need is truth, always. Yeah. They need to know exactly the objective truth. And that's the whole job right there. So you tell them the truth, always. Because that's the only yardstick they got most of the time. Most of the time, it's so subjective, especially for singers, lead yeah. guitar players. You know, yeah. Well, everybody, everybody. Sure. Yeah, right. everybody. Yeah. So, so, it, so, so, what you need is somebody that ain't gonna fucking bullshit you one iota, and that that's really what you want, and 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 that's how you you produce properly. 
And it, you don't take on airs. You don't say you're better. You say, hey, I got this idea. Maybe this is better. Let's try this. Yeah. You know, somebody sums up with something. It's a bad idea. You go, no, that's a fucking bad idea. Shut up. Let's go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, got, you, you, you don't have time. Okay. These days it's much more relaxed because you don't have to, you know, be fucking, be a cunt and be your bossy. Yeah. But if you but if you're on studio time and you're mm. burning fucking, you know, then you gotta get shit done. And you know, if you know how to do it, you do it, you know, and you say, Look, maybe mine it's not the only it's not the only way to do it. It's right. not the only way to skin a cat, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But you say, Hey, but it is the way I know how to do it, and it's gonna be the fastest way to do it. So yeah. you know, and the thing is it's like the fucking army and the, all the armed forces. You know, you got to make a decision, even if it sucks. Make a fucking decision because you can't. You, you can't stand there like, oh, I don't know. You know, you got to go. <laughs> right. Yeah, cut the fucking cut that fucking verse in half. Go. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Okay. You know, the, and, the, and just go for it. Yeah. And then later on, don't be afraid of going. You know what? Put the fucking other half back in the verse. Yeah. And everybody goes, what? And he goes, I was wrong. Put it back in. And they're like, fucking what? like this guy. This guy, you know, this guy's fucking working it, working it. Always looking to make the project better. That's all you're trying to do is make yeah. it better. Throw yeah. stuff in. Yeah, See yeah. if you can push it, push it. You know, where's right. the fucking hook? Why are you doing this song if there's no chorus? Don't do this song. Yeah. Find another song or find me a fucking chorus. Sure. You know, all these things, all these things. This is the problem now is people can't make world class records because there's ten thousand records a day coming out or whatever yeah. it is. I mean, it's yeah. unbelievable. So yeah. nobody's making world class <clears throat> records because because nobody gives a shit. Because it doesn't matter how good the record is, there's only only fucking two people going to listen to it anyway. Right. And right. they and and they're both they're both related to you. So. Yeah. Right. Well, this is this yeah. is where I want to interrupt and say yeah. this is why Dangerous Toys hadn't put out a record since 1995. <laughs> yeah because i don't think and you know you, yeah i have this yeah. argument no one's gonna fucking listen to it i mean fans are argue want to argue with me fans all day long you're crazy i can't wait you guys are lazy all this shit and i'm going eh, part of my brain is like not enough people give a shit like you well, said you said it i didn't say it yeah this time. no i i it's <laughs> well it's very difficult and and yeah. you know Actually, I had a thought this morning as I was uh, going about my whatever. I was painting this back wall, actually. Um, I was thinking, uh, I, I'm trying to think where the industry is going mm. and, 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 and where it's happening. And, and, and it, to me, there's a lot more activity of live stuff. And to me, it shows that there's a lot of longevity in, in live performance, whether it be a cover band, whether it be uh, uh, what's the other name for a cover band? A, a, tribute. A, a tribute band. Tribute band. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Or an original band. And I think, you know, the tribute and the cover bands are huge now. Fucking yeah. huge. Yeah. It's uh, so huge that Kiss now can become a cover band of itself and keep going, actually. Yeah. yeah. So uh, well, even though they, they don't want to pay anybody, so they're going to use computers. But, you know, uh, whether that'll work out or not, I don't know. You know, maybe well, we, AI can help them. We could do a whole episode on that shit. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But what anyway? What I was thinking was maybe the future of, uh, or some of the future of music is 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 live performance, and I was thinking maybe I should just put a whole a rig together and a little van or a truck and just go out and just punch, just get performances from these clubs. You know, you guys are playing out all the time. Just go out get all these and just keep pumping them out. Just fucking kind of live mix them. Don't fuck with them too much, you know, fix the shit that needs fixing a little bit, blah, 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 you know, whatever. But then bang them out because intrinsically that th those things can't be kind of reproduced. So right. it, it, it becomes, and I remember years ago, I used to love the live albums because you can really hear the guys playing. You can really hear how, it, how good everybody was. 
Right. You know, on the record, it's like you didn't, you know, it's all like kind of sterilized and, and, and in the right place and all this kind of stuff. And you knew what the song was. You didn't necessarily get the real character of these players until you go and see them live. And then, and then, but everybody gets that through osmosis, right? They, they feel it. You go see a band and you can feel them move, all, all working at the same time. There's, there's a, 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 a multi-way conversation at the same time. There's a quantum thing going on here with a band where everybody is in tune and moving around. They're, they're, they're finding the right place. So these actually are now becoming very special events because everybody's trying to computerize everything. So I see maybe there's a, a, a good opportunity there to actually just start going out, you know, fucking mic it up, press record. We just record the whole fucking evening have a few beers, quick mix the next day, bang, put it out, yeah. you know, and, and uh, it becomes um, like a service. So I think, I you, think Metallica, a, I think Metallica does that for their fan base, for their fan yeah. club. I think they release it the next day and they, they get a CD in the mail oh, with, a, show. with a little note. Yeah. I think Pearl Jam uh, did something similar. Pearl Jam did something. For a, like a season or something, they did yeah, that for yeah. their... It, it, I, I agree with you 100%. I think that uh, the live show is never the lost art. It's actually the original idea because there were no records. There was only live music. And I believe that in, you know, in the olden times, it was... Uh, uh, that's not a damn your old joke, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, I believe I actually, church... it went right by me. I didn't even grab it. <laughs> Good. But now you oh, mention it. I reeled... <laughs> that an old... I reeled it back in so you'd feel a whip snap <laughs> yeah, there. Yes. Yeah, thanks, no, I thanks, think it yeah. was like in the churches and shit, Max. I think it was like at church. Like people would go horse and buggy and, tra and you know, fucking wagon train to go to the churches to see a band play like revivalist. Well, and it was well I, I, yeah i mean there's, there's no doubt that there's no doubt that uh, one person playing live is interesting because there's always unexpectedness and then two people is a little more interesting than just two people because they are responding to each other so that, so there's this two way conversation going on and then of course when you have three piece and the three piece becomes even more common look at cream look at taste or Rory yeah. Gallagher's bands, yeah. you know, these older bands. And listen, when I was growing up, there wasn't any recordings, really. I had a little tape, little cassette tape machine. I actually had a little reel-to-reel, -reel, portable reel-to-reel, -to -reel too. Ran on fucking great batteries that ran out after about 20 minutes. But, uh, <laughs> you know, in those days, there, there wasn't any way, there wasn't all the media. So you had to go see the band. I think I saw Rory Gallagher maybe 12, 13 times. I went wow. to see Taste. You know, and I would go and see, we would go to the local blues club and see, you know, I remember going to see Rod Stewart and the Faces, you know, at the local blues club, the fucking 150 seater, you know. Well, no seats, but 150, yeah. you know. A I mean, pub, in those, a pub gig. That's yeah. Basically, yeah, a little yeah. pub upstairs, upstairs in this fucking, up, above the pub, you know, in a fucking, like a meeting hall or whatever they call well, them, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So those kind of places... But these kind of pub gigs, and that's why in England it's always been very much, a, you know, lots of pub gigs. They still do it all the time now. People go. People go Friday night because they've got a great band and all kinds of people show up. People show up and jam, and they have a great live band. And people don't give a shit if they're famous or not. They just right. go because the band's fucking kicking ass. Yeah. And they can feel it. You know, they feel it. The band's lifting them up. Yeah. So uh, that, that whole live thing, very, very underestimated now, I think, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you about, I mean, your, your list of credits is phenomenal. And I know our, our listeners and our viewers are going to be interested in, in hearing some stories about uh, some of the artists you've worked with. And, and we touched on Ozzy and Randy a minute ago, but I wanted to ask you about Randy specifically. Um, you, you know, as cliche as this question is going to sound, did you know, when you were in the studio with him, that you were making something special? And were there any, I mean, everybody wants to say, oh my God, he was phenomenal. He was phenomenal. But were there any things with you as a producer that Randy found challenging in the studio? And did you feel overall that you were doing something like you had never done before and you'd, you were making something that was going to, to last and stand the test of time and be considered a classic? 
Um, that's a really long question. <laughs> but, uh, no, at the, you know, at the time, and probably Jason will concur with this, you know, at the time you really don't know because uh, you're inside the bubble. So you don't know uh, about the relevance and whether people, uh, 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 whether this music is at the right time because timing is, is a huge thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, my thoughts about that, the first record Blizzard of Oz, was that this, this was kind of a little outdated now because uh, I'd already done like five tours with Uriah Heat before I went in the studio, and that was from 1975 to 1980. So to me, 1980, uh, there, there was a lot more exciting things happening like uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra, um, uh, Weather Report, uh, 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 some uh, to me a lot more interesting musically bands that were more complex, more p- progressive, if you like, mm-hmm. uh, Genesis and these they all you know these kind of bands that are actually sort of morphed into you know much more complex music. So to me, music was fairly simplistic, but it it, it seemed to work fine. Um, Randy, I think, struggled with everything because he wanted to play it better, play it better, play it better. But he was old school in the way, in the fact that once he knew what to play, he he didn't change the notes. He just changed the way he played the notes, hmm. and that's what he worked on. And I've worked with I've worked with quite a lot of jazz people, and I worked with Clarence Thomas, Clarence Clements, for instance, a sax player, right, and. What a, what a jazz guys do is they you give them a solo, eight bars. The guy plays five notes as he goes through it. Then he play it again. He plays different five notes, and then he then he starts playing the same notes, but he changing where he's playing them, how he's playing them, what emotion he can push into each note. And Randy did very much the same thing. Once he had the, 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 once the solo was written, he, he would then work on the, the feel of the solo and the fluidity of the solo. And when it, when it came, when it, you know, the, the movement of the solo generally, musically. Right. So in that sense, he's like what Uli Roth would call an old school player. He's like an, you know, old school player in that term, because he's looking for the beauty in the notes. He's not looking for the technical exercise or the fact that it's fast or slow or whatever he's looking for it to work and to work musically and to be beautiful and that 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 is an interesting thing so whereas i thought that his his solos were pretty good but nothing super spectacular to me i was impressed by the fact that he continued once he could play them he continued to play them until he could play them how he wanted to play them, and, and that that was that was the interesting thing to me. It's kind of a second level thing, you know what I mean? Mm. And I thought that was a very interesting thing. And as we as we started to go through it, um, we're inside the bubble, so I don't know if this is going to work or not. To me, this is maybe a couple of years too late in England. Mm. We got like new age stuff going on you got pop stuff you got electronic stuff you got synthesis you know this is maybe a little dinosaurish if you like you know you're thinking well i don't know man but of course the u.s a big rock place the u.s loves rock and yeah. so it, it as soon as it got out to the u.s and and then because the u.s you know oh it gets big in the u.s then by sort of definition it com- comes back to england it was, and then gets big, big, big back in England again. So, you know, it's one of these, you know, it's the bounce thing that happens across the Atlantic, which happens all the time with all kinds of music. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So, so yeah, you know, so I mean, I was uh, reasonably impressed. I mean, it was it's hard work making those records. I had to be I had to co- concentrate all the time, and we didn't have a lot of time to do them. So had to had to make decisions all the time. Concentrate very a lot of concentration to make sure I didn't fuck it up. You right. know. 
How, how difficult? Uh, how difficult was it working with Ozzy at that point? Because I mean, as everyone knows, he was, he was a mess at that point. I mean, just go. an absolute mess. So you're in the studio trying to <laughs> you're in the studio trying to revive this man's career. How how difficult is that? You know, fucking Ozzy's a great singer, man. Yes. You know, so and he's still a great singer. Yeah. And people, you know, people slag him off. Fucking guy sings like a bird. He's so, underrated. You know, I don't, I don't, big time. People yeah. just think it. People just think he's a he's an idiot, but he's not an idiot. He's a fucking great singer. So the way he does the vocals, and I'm sure you've heard the whole story before. But the way he does the vocals is, you know, you you got two tracks, right? So you're ready the first track. You go here it comes. You punch him in. He sings the first line. You stop the tape. He goes, "How was it?" You go, "Not bad, Oz." He goes, "Do it again." So you roll back, same punch. So you punch one line. How was it? Pretty good, that one. Double it. Roll back, punch him in on the other track. Double it right right then, right when he sang it. So that way he gets that real silky kind of tight double with the little flange in the middle. That And that's his signature sound. And that's how he does that because he will never sing it the same twice. But the set, you know... If, if he sings it right after he just sang the take, then he'll probably get it real close. You know, short so, term, short term memory. Yeah, yeah, short term, <laughs> short, short term vocal. So, so he does that, and then and then okay, next line. So you hear that one, then you punch him, and that's why you got that oi, 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 because mm-hmm. I punched him in at the front of the song, and he goes, and he's like, oi, oi, and then he starts singing. So it goes, okay, do it, you know, double it. So we go back on the other track, but he forgot where it was. So he, he goes, and he forgot about it. So he's like, and he goes, oi, and he goes, oi, and he goes, oi. And he, goes, oi. <laughs> and he, and he starts laughing. Wow. And but he goes, he goes, keep that, keep that. I said, oh, I'm keeping it. Don't worry about that. I just <laughs> thought you hit the delay. I just thought you hit a no, delay. No, no, he, no, no. He, he, he sang yeah. those, huh? <laughs> Far he out. He sang it on, yeah, yeah, he wow. sang oi. Oi. And then yeah. when he first, when he heard the other track, it went, oi, oi, oi. He right. was like, what? Yeah. yeah. So I, he just left it. You know? Let me, let me interrupt the, the vibra slap, <laughs> the donkey call. Did you play that? Yeah. 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 I knew it. I fucking could have made <laughs> money on that bet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I always tried to get a vibra slap on every record. I think I told you that years ago. Yeah. I think but, so. Yeah. 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 There's one familiar. on black, there's one on black tiger. I think there's one on Armored Saint, you know. Yeah. I'm also I'm also doing a a, a, do, a two calm call in there, like ah ah. Oh. One of our, wow, I should have I should have <laughs> yeah, I, I should have put money on that one too. <laughs> oh, now you can win. Now you can win some money at the in the bar. I know who did that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I find it interesting that you know the the. I'm I'm trying to grasp the dynamics between the people in the studio because you've got you've got Ozzy who's kind of obviously already well known but is not having his best day around 1980. Then you've got Randy who is kind of a young upstart who's very talented but is probably going to defer to the boss. And then you've got Bob Daisley who's probably the main songwriter in the whole mix. So how volatile is this chemistry? Are, is there a lot of arguing and, and, and fighting over who's doing what? And are you in the middle of it trying to coach it all? Or are, is everybody kind of on the same page despite oh, their disparate yeah. backgrounds? Uh, uh, no, uh, it, was, it was very relaxed. Um, Bob was really in charge. Uh, as far as uh, um, uh, as far as kind of being the band leader, if you like, yeah. So you know, he would be okay. Let's run, you know, let's run it again, you know. And of course, if Ozzy's in there, then that de- you know, Bob defer to Ozzy, and Ozzy will call it, or they'll you know work it out between them. Whether you know, run another one. Listen, you know, with what's you know, how about we fix this bit, whatever you know. But um, uh, most of the stuff had been worked out already, so uh, they really pretty much knew what they were doing uh, on Blizzard. So that you know, 
there wasn't really any uh, kind of arrangement change going on. And basically, once Chris had left, what happened was we brought the drums out of that horrendous room and put them in the main studio, which is a big barn. So it was very, it was pretty damp. And as as any probably any engineer might tell you, you know, you really you don't really want to record your drums in a big fucking boomy fucking echoey room. You really want to record unless the room sounds really terrific, and none of them do. So the best thing is to just record it in the fucking most dead place you possibly can, because then at least you can fix the fucking things. If you record it in a big open space, then you're fucked pretty much. Yeah. But anyway, but but so, but anyway, the uh, that was very neutral space and really kind of a bit like being out in the open almost because it's a big studio. So and it's very dead in there. So um, it was very easy to put him out there and um, and get a and get a sound fast that was controllable, and uh, it brought the drums immediately up front. That was a very upfront drum sound on the on Blizzard. Uh, there's no reverberation whatsoever, and there's no compression whatsoever. So uh, people are always asking me, "Oh, what preamps did you use?" You know, and I'm like, "The the SSL preamps, you know, because one, yeah, the ones in the did... ones in the console. Uh, yeah, the ones yeah. in the console. People have this thing about, oh, you got to have this preamp, or you got to have this. I got to tell you, the the the, the placement and the mic." is going to make much more difference than the preamp and, and the fucking player is going to make about a thousand times more difference. So I wouldn't be worrying about preamps ever if I were you because mm. every preamp in the world now is much better than the ones probably then. But, you know, any preamp is okay, you know, but, you know, whatever. The purists will pick the Neves and the whatever, you know, but whatever. So, but the the the, the real the real crux of that was that the drums are recorded very dry. It's a pretty dry room and they're very, they're close mic and uh, the cymbals are pretty close mic also. So uh, it was a pretty coherent sound and you could just throw them up and that's, that's pretty much what it sounded like. And everything was built around that. So everything's pretty dry on that first Blizzard of Oz record yeah. uh, because, you know, because, uh, you're trying to maintain some kind of image of, of the band, you know, you're trying to, you know, so you don't have like really echoey this and really dry there. You know what I mean? You're trying to put them in a certain sort of acoustic space all the time, you know, unless you're doing like dance music or something like that. But, but so that, that, that was one of the key things about that. And uh, the, the, one of the other key things about that record is that the band uh, put it down maybe three times and and we picked a you know we just picked one you know and uh that's there's a lot of truth to be to the fact that it, you know the first time and i've heard actually quite a lot of, even session players will tell you this they used to do uh you know these fucking great session players in la and they'll put together a whole band out of session guys and they deliberately won't rehearse them they'll bring them in they say hey, give them all the sheets and go okay let's hit it and they fucking cat they grab the first or second take because that's when everybody fucking keys and that's when everybody's excited and fucking that's when the most generation is happening. Yeah. And then the third take is not as good. Then the fourth take is not as good. And after that, you it's it's kind of it's a program. Yeah. So, you know, so one of the things about that Blizzard of Oz, especially, is that it's very raw, but it those are those are real fast takes and so you know they were when the band first it first started sounding good it was exciting the band ripped it out those first few takes are the ones you got to try and grab all the time you know yeah did you uh did you do you recall i'm sure that you remember this but much like records you would make right now versus blizzard were you using a click track where did you beep? Did you go to rehear any kind of rehearsal and clock all the songs and write them down and take notes and stuff such like that to to just kind of help them feel what they were feeling in the rehearsal room before you know pre production rehearsal kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, I mean I, I did that. I evolved those methods later on that yeah. we used with you guys yeah. and that we used with you know, um, 
Uh, no, in, in in those cases, this was just a band came in. I pressed record, basically. Uh, wow. You know, I didn't have any. So, you know, I basically made sure, as an engineer, made sure everything didn't distort. That's the first thing. Right. Make, second thing is make sure you get everything recorded. Make sure the fucking mics aren't broken. You know, make sure the mic's in the right place. That's a little bonus, you know. And then, yeah. you know, get better and better from there So and try and build a picture so the band can see what they're doing. And see what they're doing wrong, and that's that's the engineer's job, is to present what's being done in the best possible light, and to be as empathic as possible to the process. You know? Yes. So that, that's yes. what you do as an engineer. So. Well, listen, you you, you also had uh, Randy Rhodes, Bob Daisley, and Lee Kerslake, so you didn't have to worry <laughs> yeah, yeah. about tempos failing, falling, yeah. rising. You know, they were keeping their cool the whole fucking time, and so yeah, you had the. The, yeah, arguably I mean, the best rock band to work with. So, well, you know, and and one of the most important production ideas is the fact that you got to know when to shut the fuck up Ooh. and just record the fucking band. Yeah, yeah, you know, because that 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 can make you the biggest producer in the world. You just go, yeah. They've got it. <laughs> you know, let them, you, let them when do it, it. if yeah. it's working, if it's working, it's working. Yeah. You know, what, what you're looking for, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for, I'm looking to remove the badness. <laughs> remove the badness. If I hear some badness, like, eh, some badness, remove that badness. That's Take like that piece out. That's like, Change that piece. that's like Gandalf the Gray. Is he removing <laughs> badness? Yeah, well, I kind of look like Gandalf. Well, piece, that so. was another damn your old joke that I was trying to <laughs> not. <laughs> well, I went, funnily enough, it's very funny you say that because I went to uh, my brother's uh, 70th birthday. was about four years ago. He's older than me, but he was about four years ago. So I flew to England to surprise him on his birthday. And I was hiding in his garden when he came. His, his wife brought him out and said, oh, come out here a minute, you know. And she's like, what's going on? You know, all fucking grumpy, you know. So I walk around the corner and he goes, it's fucking Gandalf. So he, he he called me that as well. So I'm obviously hitting a nerve with the hair somehow. Well, that's all right. I remember when it wasn't so silverish. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Diary Diary was recorded shortly after Blizzard. So having said everything you just said, were were there any adjustments made to how you approached Diary or was everything kind of locked in after Blizzard and it was kind of a just continuation of Blizzard? Well, it wasn't right after Blizzard, though. There's a lot of people that say that, but it, it was like maybe nine months later. Okay. Because we did, I did Rough Diamond and a couple other albums in between. Um, but uh yeah i was significantly different i think that the the certainly the writing uh was better the songs were better they're more more uh there are more parts in the songs yeah you know there are more bits yeah there's like modulations and all kinds of shit going on they'd expanded the idea of using choir and using string section we went and did the uh the strings so it was the london symphony orchestra sing, string section in abbey road i was like i'm like yeah i'm big yeah. in this this is fucking great i gotta tell you so we get there right and we got the guy from electric light or that does all of electric light orchestras arrangements mm. um lou and i can't remember his second name i'll, I'll probably remember in a minute but anyway lou um he sadly passed away not too long ago, but he was, he's amazing arranger. But so we're sitting there and we got the whole, they're all sitting out on the floor, 26 piece strings. Uh, we're in downstairs where they did the fucking Beatles. It's the Beatles with the same fucking console and all this shit. So I'm standing there. I'm like, I'm not touching nothing, but the guy's getting it all together. He's got it all sorted out, you know? So I only had four tracks, two, two stereo, two stereo. So what we, what we want to do is get double track orchestra. So anyway, it's 10 o'clock. Lou's not there. It's 10, 20 past 10. We're about 20 minutes into a three hour session, right? He comes walking in with two pints of beer from the, because they got a bar upstairs in Abbey Road. They got a bar, right? So he comes walking in two pints of beer. So it's 10, 20 in the morning. 
we're like everybody looks at them like he goes where's the copyist puts a beer down drinks drinks the other beer almost the whole thing puts it down where's the copyist goes i'm over here he goes right he grabs a bunch of stove starts writing just starts writing the shit out. It's like Amadeus. Remember that film where he just yeah. starts writing? The, this, <laughs> this fucking guy just starts writing the parts out from his from his head. And so he writes out the first sheet, gives it to the copy guy. Copier starts fucking copying it out. Dude, 10 minutes later, he's lose out on the floor with a bat on, <laughs> tapping it on the thing. Everybody's got the music. He goes, okay, run through. Gives it points to us. Guy goes, here it comes. Boom. Start playing. I'm like, Wow. Fucking Lou. So we do one. He goes, and he, he, uh, Lou made a couple of changes. He goes, oh, you know, uh, second violin. That's a D sharp. Yeah, you got it. Okay. And he did a couple of these things. The fucking guy obviously done it a million times, you know. Yeah. So we're all like, <laughs> so he goes, okay, we're going to do one more run through and then we'll do a take. So I go, I fucking nudge the guy, the engineer. I go, record it. So he records it, the run through. We go, yeah, sounds great. Let's take it. Put him on a couple more tracks. I hit the guy. He turns off the other ones, you know. So that way we get a double track. Because if you if you tell him, you got to pay him twice. Ooh, <laughs> so yeah. it's session okay. session fee. Sure. Uh, for a double, uh, yeah. Session fee for a double track. Well, right. 26, 26 pieces. You don't want to pay him twice, right? No. Do you think so I'll, probably get, I'll probably get sued now from the fucking London oh, Symphony? Fuck. <laughs> this is the this is the this is the intro to uh, Diary of a Madman we're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do, That's do, you, do you think that Lou... none of us had heard it? <clears throat> and none of us had heard it. Wow. Well, that was so my just, question. You know. That was going to be my question. Do you think Lou was like in the bar, like listening to a little tape deck of it, or something? I mean, how did he know? <laughs> how did he know the the key of for the oh, charts. No, he had the oh no he had the he had a, a copy of the song right he had a copy of the rough mix but he's not walking maybe a, but he's a week but he's not walking you know? in he's not walking in going okay play me the track so obviously he'd done his homework he just came from the fucking bar and he had the pitch and everything in his head oh yeah yeah he he had all the parts written he just didn't write them out yet he had right. them all written in his head yeah right. i mean yeah uh I'm trying to remember his second name. Quite a very an amazing guy, really, really good, you know. I mean, I we were like we were fucking laughing. I mean, it was the funniest thing, you know. And we walked out, we look, looked at each other like, what the fuck just happened there? <laughs> yeah. And it, and we we added to which we're hearing this stuff and it goes goes again in the you know, the whole arrangement. We're like Oz is just like gobsmacked, you know, the guy's like just like <laughs> So we get in the car and fucking drive back to the studio, you know. So I'm sorry, it was, <laughs> it was you and Ozzy at Abbey Road watching this shit happen? No, me and Ozzy and Bob. Oh, wow. I think Randy, Randy might even have been. We might all have gone up there. I don't okay. know. I don't know okay. if Randy was there. Maybe he was. Okay. But everybody went up there. Yeah, we were all just sitting there like. <laughs> yeah. You you said at the yeah. start of the you said at the start of this conversation about uh these first two Aussie albums that you know you were in the bubble and a little too close to it to sort of judge it. But all these years later, when you look back on it, uh how do you feel about it in hindsight as, as when you listen back to it after all these years? Do you see them as the monumental albums that people hold them up to be, or to you was it still just another day at work? Well, I, I appreciate them. I mean, I think they, I think they're good records, you know. And I mean, you know, uh, it, it's always difficult when you make a record. I don't think you can ever hear it like other people hear it again, <laughs> you know. Even if you wait twenty years, you know, when you listen to it, you still go, "Oh yeah, oh wait a minute, yeah," and that, you know, because there's all these things. There's there's little badness bits, and you go, "Oh, what you, oh, oh, you know," but yeah. so. You know, as a you know, but it depends. Now I've kind of learned to listen more as a producer. Uh, I've learned to listen in different ways. Like, in, so if you listen as a producer, then you hear all the bad bits. But then if you just turn that off and just fucking you know don't you know and just listen without you know analyzing, yeah. Then, then it, then then you can appreciate what's going on. And I mean, I I think. Um, 
you know, the songs work. And the, the thing about them is that they're very true. It's just what happened at that point in time, pretty much. Yeah. So, do you think that, do you, do you, would you like to eloquently without name calling, uh, act your age, young, young man, uh, say, say, be, be very, very kind and nice when you say this, but would you care to comment or not comment? God, that would be a total, totally fine answer is no comment on the re-recording of bass and drums Ooh. during the 2000s. Do you? Ah. Ah. Well, yeah, well. Uh, yeah, I'll they, comment uh, if he uh, won't. <laughs> well, be, care <laughs> well, Dave, be careful, <laughs> I, because, you know, we're fans here. We don't want to... Right. Yeah. Feathers shan't this, be ruffled. No, this, this, is, this is a this, great question. That's a great question. Yeah, Dave. but I don't want to take all day because there's other kick-ass shit that I want to talk to Max about. <laughs> yeah, so I know. Just, let's make this well, quaint. Uh, okay, well, then, okay, so the story about, well, you know, Eddie Trunk asked me the same thing. Oh, shit. And, and we got into that conversation... Ooh. And and then I got a cease and desist from uh, Sharon and Ozzy's lawyers. Okay, that's so, that's fair, but I mean, and just the reason a... that's because the reason was because I you know said that I thought it was unfair. But you know, um, I was called uh, by Sharon okay. to do it, and I said to her, but basically verbatim, "Look, I know why you're doing this, and I don't agree with it, so I'm not going to do it." And that's basically what the story was and okay. then so that i was bypassed and they did it with the uh, you know somebody else and you know they figured it out or whatever but yeah when i heard it i was like well the the whole reason that blizzard especially blizzard it was good was because it was a, 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 a coherent recording of those musicians that's right and when you and when you remove that's like chopping out fucking half and, and sticking an orange onto an apple, you know, it, 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 you end up with something certainly different and usually that doesn't work. And one of the interesting things is that, and I learned this later on during the tribute, and there's another interesting story about that. Uh, I got two cassettes from Sharon and she said, which, which show shall we mix? So I listened to them and the cassettes were mixed very differently. And one cassette was uh, really exciting and the other was kind of not very exciting. So uh, I said, oh, well, we have to go for the exciting one. And the reason it was, it was exciting was because Randy was fucking really loud. Mm -hmm. And Randy was like rushing like fucking crazy. So if you put Randy back in the mix where he's supposed to be, it sounds like shit because the guy's way in front. But if you mm -hmm. crank him up, then everybody forgets about everything else. It sounds great. So, and th th then I realized after listening to these two performances that they were actually the same performance. It was just a different mix. Oh. So I'm like, ah, bing. <laughs> make sure Randy's really loud in the mix, basically. Yeah. In in the live thing because he's really on top of everything. So, if if you put him where he's supposed to be, it it, it just doesn't jive. He just needs to be certainly louder. It's like if you've got a lead singer that's out of tune, turn him up. Because then you can't compare him against the backing track, and he'll sound like he's in tune. So, you know, th these are kind of things. The, the content determines the mix in a lot of cases. You know? These are things yeah. that I have learned from live recordings as well, I feel yeah. like a, an an artist, a musician who listens to their live recordings as homework to try to not sing sharp and not rush and whatever, like a guitar player should listen if they like to play faster than everybody else and they're finishing the song before the drummer. I, I feel like it's a great tool to become a better player, but it's a constant practice. Like a professional has to practice. They're a professional, so they need to fucking practice. But at yeah, the same yeah. time, I'm, I'm saying mixing that you can take this really great performance. Who cares if there's a couple of bad notes in there? The fucking, I mean, Mick Jagger's not the best singer in the fucking world, but you know what? He's a performer. You listen to it and you mix it. You mix it in the right way, whatever that may be. 
it's going to blow your, it's going to blow you away. So it's the same yeah, thing. Yeah. And I like yeah. to hear my vocals, you know, as loud as the guitar ish and not louder than the guitar for all of those reasons. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, 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 the thing about having you level with the guitars, which is a, an admirable trait, because that's probably where it should be. Mm. The problem with that is that your tuning has to be a little better because because you're sitting in the same band and it's easy for the ear to to heterodyne between the two, as you know. So yes, you know, the, those are those are kind of things. But yeah, you know, yeah, 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 there are all these tricks. But I, I wanted, I just want to mention that. Before I got into the studio, one of the tours, the first tour I went on in America, that I was rigging PA at that time, was the Robin Trower tour. And <sighs> Robin recorded every night uh, from the console on a big Revox reel to reel. And after the show, he went straight in the dressing room and he made him and the band, they sat there and they listened to the whole show every night. Wow. And I thought that was. Um, I agree with you. I think it's a great trait, and I, I think any any live band should be doing that every show. They should review it. They should look at what they're doing. You know, I mean, there are some great bands out there. You know, I, 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 I've i seen Death Angel in the last couple of years, and they are so fucking tight. They are, they are so fucking good on stage. Yep. You know, some of it, I, I don't even like some of the songs, but it fucking blows me away. I'm just like, dude, these guys fucking just nail it and they're not even looking they're not even fucking trying they're fucking leaping around the shit's tight as tighter than the duck's ass you know so when you when you got bands out there like that that's what you got to strive for you can always you know you can always get better absolutely yeah. and you can't get better without the feedback loop so you got to have you got to listen you got to correct listen yeah. correct yeah, yeah. Last you know. Aussie question, and then we'll move on because you have so much other <laughs> stuff I want to talk about. Why aren't you credited as the producer on Blizzard of Oz? Well, it, because um, uh, it was really kind of an uh, of an afterthought um, that uh, we had kind of angled for it on the uh, diary, and uh, I think I got a couple of grand. <laughs> Okay. For, for for producing, but uh, on on Blizzard, it's really I stepped in as engineer and look. the The line between engineer and producer is if you're the engineer and there isn't a producer or the band's producing, then the engineer is also co-producing because they're making a decision in the control room on what people are doing on the studio floor most of the time. I just so, want to you know. I, I just want to hold this up real quick. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm really good at interrupting, by the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, I have a, and you've seen the photo. This is, I'm holding up for our listeners and not our watchers. This is a photo from Sound City in, you know, the sometime around the end of 1988, probably November, October. And this is Max Norman's ass. Shove, he's sho you're shoving your head into Mark's kick drum, uh, microphones and stuffing and whatever, yeah. and you and you hadn't quite got the 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 moving packing blanket over the fucking thing yet because you're working on the rim and the head, and that's the drum doctor. Remember that guy? Yeah, yeah. The drum doctor, he's behind yeah. you over here. And you can't really yeah. see him. And then that's Mark going, what the fuck are you doing behind us taking a photo of this bullshit? But, <laughs> but here you are on your knees shoving, you know, working on stuffing the kick drum and stuff like that. So that's an engineer. An engineer does shit like that. And just I have proof that you are engineering some shit. And it's <laughs> yeah. producer on the record, but you're also getting your hands fucking dirty. So Yeah, because I, I went back to my Blizzard of Oz record that I bought in 1980. It's well-worn. And uh, Max is not, Max is credited as engineer, but not as producer. I think the producer credit goes to Ozzy and. Uh, yeah. yeah. Some people uh, like just, I let it slide. If people say I produced it, I'm like, okay. Well, I, that's what you I want think it. you did. Based but the truth, on what we well, you know, all I, all I say is that, look, you know, Ozzy's singing. I'm in the control room. That's, it's just, two, it's just us two. 
So if if we're making the decisions together, then I say I guess it's a shared production responsibility. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, enough you know enough, I mean? Ozzy. I know we've kicked your brain <laughs> to death, and and we didn't even get to bark at the moon, or 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 I wanted to delve into tribute a little more, but we got to move on. I wanted to ask you one of my favorite Maybe records. Yeah. One of my very favorite records of all time is Cool from the Wire by Dirty Looks. What's yeah. your what what are your memories of that session? Well, you know, I the the thing was uh I got the I got all the demos from that and they're all pretty good and the obvious comparison at that point was ACDC and and Bon Scott this this guy did the best Bon Scott I ever heard as probably Jason knows. Because you got some history with that band now too, right? That, that's so, correct. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, Henrik. Uh, well, Henrik's one of those guys that as soon as you meet him, you know this guy is probably going to die. You know, he's, he's probably not going to live his whole life. He's one of those guys. I, I, I don't mean that in a horrible way, no, or like a fucking ghoulish way, but it's just one of those guys you go. And I think, you know, it was, I don't know, it's kind of troubled or I don't, I don't know what the deal was. And he was, he was quite religious too. And I don't know if that, I don't know if that contributed or I don't know what, I don't know what happened, but he likes scotch a lot. I know that. Mm -hmm. So, but. Dangerous, uh, so cool dangerous, dangerous personality. You think? Just live fast. Yeah. Living he, fast, you know, dangerous personality. I, I tell you. Henrik was one of those guys. I, we went down to Pennsylvania and we're in one of these little coal towns and we go out to a little bar, Henrik and I. And Henrik's got that fucking look on his face. Like, this kind of. And these fucking guys, we walk in, two long head guys, we walk in, we're standing at the bar and there's a bunch of fucking rednecks in there and they're all, they're all looking at Henrik. And I'm, I'm like, we're going to get a fucking ass kicking in here for sure. I go take a piss. If this guy comes, stands next to me, he goes, we're going to kick the fuck out of your friend. And I look at him and I go, why is that then? He goes, because he's an ugly motherfucker. So I look to the guy and I zip my fly up and I walk out and I walk towards the door and I grab Henrik by the arm and I say, you're coming with me. And I'm a fucking whip him out the door and we get in the van and before we can pull out this fucking 12 guys around the van a couple of them with fucking baseball bats mm. and I'm like oh mm. this is not going to be nice so the fucking they're all like you motherfucker get out the fucking van you know and actually they're not fucking giving me any shit they're fucking aiming all this at him and I'm like what the fuck you know I'm a I'm a hey I'm a hippie too what the yeah. fuck you know but you know, but anyway, some girl, a girl came out and fucking chilled him out and we fucking roared off in the van. But we nearly got our ass kicked. But I swear to God, every time I went out with Henrik, fucking to crack that shit like, like, like flies on fucking rice or whatever. White on rice or flies on butter or whatever the fuck. There's something it very, terrible. there's something very, I, I hear that that's a dangerous personality. That's the, that's the story that fits it. But I, I feel like. That's so fucking rock and roll and so <laughs> it is. fucking dirty looks. And yeah. so, and so Henrik. Yeah. And, and, you yeah. know, when I spent time with him, which was, wasn't, I could count them on one hand, they were special times. So I can imagine that, you know, to Dave's question, the memories that you have, and, and, and I'm sure Dave probably more so in the studio at the mic on his guitar, blah, 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 and not so much in the bar, but oh my yeah. God, the, he was a one yeah. of a kind. And I've said that I wear that on my sleeve when I'm, when I'm standing and tr trying to fill his shoes when in, yeah. the, cur in the current version, but dude, yeah. Dangerous I gotta, guy. I, I, yeah. I, I, got, I got to say his, yeah, I mean, that that's his lifestyle. And, but but as a as a performer, great performer. Yes. And I went to see him a few times live, and he was just a natural, and he had that natural charisma. And it was that charisma that was what people wanted to beat him up because he had this fucking charisma, I think. And, and you that's know, that, 
that that was the thing is these rednecks fucking hated this fucking guy, you know, because yep. he walk in because the chicks fucking dug him, you know. So, <coughs> but um, you could have seen, uh, said yeah. the same shit about David Lee Roth. The 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 interesting thing is 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 everyone probably wanted to beat up Roth a little bit, but or yeah, or yeah. the dudes wanted to fuck him, <laughs> and that's why well, and I that's. Think, uh, that's why they wanted to beat him up because they didn't understand those feelings and then <laughs> you know yeah, well, I mean? a, there, yeah a little bit of the old a little bit of the old uh, uh, yeah uh, what I call it uh, I can't think of the word but you know well, yeah I mean there's some of that and you know I mean same thing for uh, the guy from Aerosmith too you know he, he, he'll he tell you stories about you know Dude looks like a. I mean, that's why they wrote that song. I think it's because of fucking people trying to kick their ass in the fucking, you know, in the truck stops and shit like that. You know. Yeah. Well, I hear, I hear, <laughs> I hear it was had to do with Vince Neil or something. Yeah, that dude well, looks like a lady. Yeah. yeah. Well, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Hey, well, I, wanted, know, right? I wanted to bring up that record, "Cool from the Wire," because it it gets a lot of plays at my house and in my car to this day. And uh, it, to me, it's one of your 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 finest hours. You may not think so because you're too close to it, but for me, no, it's a great. No, album. I actually I actually like the record, and um, they uh, I like the record a lot. I think it's a really good record. Um, we spent a lot of time in pre-production. Uh, we reworked all the songs, looked at every song, made sure that the arrangements were uh, <coughs> were working properly. Um, introduced the I introduced the uh, modulation in "Call from the Wire." It didn't have a middle eight, so we. I, I said, "Look, you, you got to, you know, let's get some relief." You know the so, breakdown, um, the but, breakdown section. Uh, yeah, when it goes, it goes up uh, a step, a whole step, I think, right in the middle. I can't remember where where it is, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know it well. Yeah, yeah. then there's a break. Yeah, yeah. So uh, stuff like that. Um, I wanted to. Uh, <clears throat> I understood the basic premise from the band, but I always want to try and push the band music-wise to be a, a little less expected, a little more unexpected, mm. and to be a little cleverer than the listener expects. That so so to be a little bit surprising, or or to do something that's a little you know, to to try and keep the listener engaged, obviously, and you know so. Always try and push them. So there's there, there's some extra stuff in that call from the wire that that we added to 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 kind of break it up a bit. There's some breakdowns in some of the songs, and you know, uh, the part but, you're talking uh, about. Hold that thought. The part you're talking about. Told you I was good at interrupting. The part you're talking about is the where he says, Un, "Under the wire, baby, faster, faster, let yourself go." That's the lift. There's a lift yeah. there, and then it yeah. breaks down for the little eh, 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 the little bluesy solo, and then he's yeah. doing the break. Well, yeah, think, that's the part. I think they had, yeah. Well, I think they had the breakdown, but I don't think they had the modulation. It didn't. So li it didn't in, lift. Yeah. Yeah. So we put the modulation in, and then of course you're looking. At, it's what they call like song smithing. You know, you sure. you, you look for something. Uh, you look for, you know, this as you're a composer too. So you you look for something that you can that will lift, and then you look for a way to get out. Because getting out, if you can't get out, then you can't do the lift. So you you always got to look at the back and go, well, okay, how do we get out of here? Do we have to stay up there? Because we can't. Because I can't sing it that high. So you know, you got to figure out a way to get well, get out of the other just end. for this, just to kind of unveil some some secrets about the Dangerous Toys record is scared the song scared yeah. did not originally start in f i believe i think it was all e all the way through and you added that step and then moved in the middle and no one realized that change that change up right yeah yeah i think it's a a, a single step again a sing, it's a it's probably an f to an e is it i think correct so. that is correct no no uh, uh, e. An nope. E to an F, an yeah. E to an F sharp. No, uh, it's 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 F to E. It's F to E. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't so remember. Same, now, but no, yeah, the was, same. It's yeah. the same. It's the same <laughs> idea that you're talking about. Yeah, and if you if you could look if you look at especially with rock stuff, rock rock and rock rock music and uh, metal music, if you like, um, if you look at uh, people like Mutt Lang, 
and how they expanded uh, bands like Led, uh, Def Leppard, uh, where the band was really pretty much a sort of AC, slow ACDC kind of thing. And it started to add, add some interest uh, by, by doing what they call overloading, which is like, okay, so you, you, go, you go to the bridge, that had, you know, and the bridge sound already sounds like a chorus. And then you, but instead of going to the chorus now, you go to another bridge, which sound, and you think, oh, this is the chorus. This is fucking great. And then all of a sudden, here's the chorus and it's fucking great. So it's like you're overloading, you're overloading, you're constantly overloading, constantly trying to, constantly trying to lift the listener into something else. And uh, Mark Lang's a genius at doing that kind of stuff. And he, he, he didn't have to. He didn't do it with ACDC, which was, again was a genius thing. He just fucking left them alone. But then with Def Leppard, who who were working on sort of much slower tempos for the most part, I think. Then he started to get into these things with photograph. Look at look at the way these things are step up. They step up. They just he got this foundation here. Then you bang. You come in here and you got the big wide fucking clean guitars, but you got some dirty ones as well. You know all this stuff, and you you know. The guy just builds and builds and builds. It's, it's genius kind of stuff. And that's what you get into when you're a producer. If you're looking at a, a rock band that's very straightforward, you, you you try and look to see if there's any angles, see if there's any way you can push open the envelope. You know, you can move them maybe in a, a little more in this direction, or a little more in this direction, or, you know, what, try and in, increase what is possible. Yeah. You know? yeah. it's It's good the demos were good because... Cool from the wire is still one of my favorite records. Yeah, and you know the re- and actually it, it um, I I really didn't do much with them apart from we we did some as far as uh, uh, we did some arrangement changing and uh, we did set tempos. Yeah, and um, then we did all that rehearsing down in Pennsylvania, and then uh, we went to. Where the hell did we? Oh, we did that in the carriage house up in uh, mm-hmm. up in Connecticut, mm-hmm. and um, so we're getting a drum sound. We get a really good drum sound. Is that where you did and, Fate's Warning? Did you do Fate's Warning in the same place? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we had a really good drum sound, and uh, at that time, that was like when the Lexing, Lexicon two two four was out. So that was really nice to have a drum room with that, and they have a fairly decent uh, room. Uh, uh, up at the carriage house. So uh, the room wasn't particularly live, but so it, was, it sounded okay. So we were able to add some ambience. And then, so I'm listening. So I said, okay, Henrik, what do you think? And he goes, reverb's too long. So I shorten the reverb, you know, too long. Shorten it, shorten it. Finally, and basically, I turned it off. He goes, on, there you go. On the vocal? <laughs> on the vocal? No, on the no, on the drums. Oh, on the drums, because right. Because at that point, yeah. this, was, this is in the 80s, so this is yeah. like kind of the big 80s drums, you know. So he goes, no, no 80s drums. So actually, if you listen to the drums on there, they're really pretty dry. I did manage to sneak a bit more back in on, on the mix, but, you know, uh, they had a pretty decent drum sound. Used to, a lot of the work in those days was on the drums, yeah. getting a dr- good drum sound. It was, yeah. it was a lot of work. You remember with the drum doctor and, mm-hmm. and uh, we... I think we had the sandpaper and we sanded the the, the rims to make them flat and do it. It's a lot of work, you know, to make yeah. them sound really good. And now nobody gives a shit because they just use samples. So. Right. <laughs> what do you remember? Is, you know, what do you remember about uh, your your time with Megadeth? You did uh, Countdown to Extinction and Euthanasia, two huge albums for that band. Um, yeah. What are your What are your memories of those sessions? Uh, well, it's a lot of it was a lot of work. I mixed Rust in Peace before that for them. Uh, I got a call from uh, Mike, and uh, he said they were down at Rombo in in North Hollywood, <clears throat> and he said, "Oh, come down." He had to go back to Guns and Roses Mike to Clink. produce a new Mike, and, Mike, Mike Clink. Clink. Yeah. Yeah, Clink. Yeah, Clink, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, I didn't. No, yeah, it's all right. Clink. And, and he, uh, he, he called me down. And so I walk into Rumbo, which I knew very well, because <clears throat> I worked there quite a lot. And I walked in there in the Studio A where the billiard table is. And Dave's in there with Dave Ellison. And Mike walks in. He goes, hey. He said, okay. He says, uh, I, need, I need you to mix this. Uh, but there's no points. 
So I go, okay, whatever. Meaning you're I'll not going to get paid. Well, no, I get paid, but it's just a fee. He okay. didn't want to give me any points. So I go, all right, whatever. So I went and mixed that over at one on one, which is on Lank, which was on Lancashire, big studio in Lancashire. But that's where uh, 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 Metallica, the Black Album, was done. Yeah, and they actually did it there because we were in there doing Lynch Mob, and they came, they came to wow. visit. Cool. And it was uh, what's his name, uh, uh, the producer, Bob, <coughs> Bob Rock. Yeah. Fuck yeah. And uh, Large. Yeah. And Large, Large, and Bob came in. Nice. And we were actually pissed off because we were in the middle of doing some <laughs> solo stuff. <laughs> and it's a funny story, actually. So we're in one on one. We're in the big room. We've had that big room locked out for a while. We're in the last throws of overdubs. And they come in and they call me on the phone. They go, oh, Bob Rock's here, here with Lars. They want to look at the studio. I said, well, we're in the middle of a session, so they got to wait. I'm sorry, you're in the session with Megadeth? Yeah, no, no, with Lynch, uh, Mob. Lynch Mob. Oh, yeah. okay, I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm in there with George Lynch, and we're doing guitars. Gotcha, okay, okay. So I look at George, I go, no, they're not coming in. I said, we're in the, it's the middle of the day. You want to, you know, you know, when we take a break, they can come in, you know. So then after about like 10 minutes, it was like fucking knocking on the, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I go, all right, you fuckers. So I let him in. I was kind of pissed off because I did, you know, it's like, no, I'm paying for the fucking time. You know, you fucking come in when I tell you you can come in. It's my room, not your room. But anyway, they fucking muscled their way in there, and him and Lars. And actually, I did say to Bob, I, I said, uh, what did I say? I, I think it pissed him off as well. I said, um, oh, Bit of a departure for you, eh, Bob? Mm. Like that. Mm. <laughs> mm. He gave me a, all he did just gave me a dirty look, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, because he Oh I, I had to fucking pay him back for interrupting me. We were in the middle of a session. He wouldn't have fucking let me in, would he? Right. <laughs> right. right. Uh, but going but going back to Megadeth, what do you uh remember about those sessions and what was it like working with Mustaine? Obviously somebody who's a very strong opinionated you know, can be sometimes bullheaded. Yeah, uh, you know, it goes. It, look, it comes back to the the, the same thing every time. You got to tell the truth. You just got to tell it like it is. And if if they don't like it, tough shit. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you got to. You, you know, so the, I get along with Dave okay because I don't bullshit. You know, I just yeah. tell him what it is. I say, you know, you know. He, well, I remember we were doing euthanasia, and he goes, "Oh, I think we should put these crying babies on the front." Of the whole album, I said no. <laughs> Don't do it. He goes, okay. <laughs> I'm <laughs> like, well, what the fuck? You want people to turn it off before they even hear the music? What the fuck is wrong with you? Well, yeah. what is on Mind the cover? What is on the cover of Euthanasia? Sorry. Well, I, I, it is. It is yeah. like lots of babies. Yeah. Right, but everybody yeah, that's what I thought. Max is talking. So about it was an apropos. Well, it was an apropos thing. I just, I, I just thought it was a bad idea. So I, you know. Probably in retrospect, maybe it would have been okay. I so know. to be clear, you're talking about the album art, and you, and you're giving him the idea. You're, he's saying he, I'm sorry, Dave wants to put crying babies like mic up some babies and have them crying, or you? He's just telling yeah, him, yeah. Oh, okay. No, he wants he wants to put crying babies on the on the front of the thing. Oh, oh, okay. Right. On the like, on the, like, the, intro, on the like an intro yeah. recording. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. 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 And Max is telling him yeah. you're gonna turn people away before they even heard the music with these crying mm, babies. Mm, mm, <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, those were two. Huge, uh, <laughs> those, were, yeah. those were those were hugely successful records, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what happened with we. So when we did, okay. So I did. We mixed Rust in Peace. Rust in Peace sold about six hundred thousand right off the bat. So it was it was their time. Yeah. So at that point, they come back to me and like it's all like okay, we got the now we got the whole formula. You know. We got the right guy behind the board. We got, you know. So Dave sends me a cassette with all the with all the demos for Countdown, and I listen to them. It's an old story. I'll tell it again real quick. They, uh, I listen to them for days and days. 
and I had no idea what to do with it. I just, you know, I didn't know. So I thought, oh, fuck it. I'll just give it one more listen, and then I'll call him back and go, okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> you know, I don't really have any ideas. And I thought, well, that, you know, so I listened to it one more time, and all of a sudden I started to <coughs> get an idea what's going on, and I started to get some ideas. And I go, oh, okay, look, this first one, this this part's too long. I don't think this part even fits. Take it out. Let's 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 look at this. So I wrote about four pages of notes for the, all of the songs, basically editing and, and and pointing out places where maybe we could figure figure something else out or giving him an idea, you know, whatever. So basically going through and fucking chopping it up like an editor, basically. Okay. So I sent him these these uh, four pages of notes. And I didn't hear anything for three or four days. And then uh, my wife at the time called me. I was upstairs. She called me and said, oh, Dave Mustaine's on the phone. So I come downstairs. I get on the phone. He goes, okay. Uh, he said, I got all your notes. So there's this big, long pause. <laughs> and I'm like, he's going he's gonna to rip me a new fucking arsehole, I can tell, you know. Um, cause I knew, already knew Dave, you know, we were already kind of friends anyway. Yeah. So, uh, he goes, he says, yeah, I said, I agree with about 99% of them. Wow. So I was like, <laughs> okay. Wow. He goes, okay. So, you know, so he said, so great, let's do it. And then we started talking about rehearsals. So, um, uh, what we did with countdown and what I've been doing up to this point, and Jason can was witness to some of these techniques is that. Having said that, you know, the first couple of times the band ever plays it properly is probably the best time they're ever going to play it. So usually you're going to go past that because you're in rehearsals and you're trying different ideas. And, and you can sometimes you can see that go by. So uh, what I used to do in rehearsals uh, in those days would be a cassette. I would record a re rehearsal especially if the band did a really good version of the song and we got the tempo right and everybody was really kicking ass and the song really, you know, happened. And it was a great performance. So I'd have it on a cassette. I would take it home and I had a spreadsheet on the computer, on the Atari. And uh, I'd, I'd clock it out with a, with a stopwatch and I'd tempo map that tape. As one way, as just one more thing that makes it exciting. And I'd look at the tempos and see why. Okay, it gets a little faster here. I'm slowing down a bit here. So then what I would do is I would put this into uh, the computer as a moving click, take it back the next day, have the band play to this click, and listen to how they're responding. And try and detect where it's pulling, where it's pushing, where it needs to where it's moving, if it's moving correctly, start to close fit this to get this part of the performance back. Now, this is only one part of the performance, yeah. but it is an intrinsic part of the performance. So the original, so now you, what you're trying to do is capture this as closely as possible, reproduce these moves in tempo, which helps you to recapture that moment because all, all kinds of things start happening when you're in the groove and the groove is correct your brain starts, you know, everything starts to work and you get this kind of, it's a bit like, maybe it's a quantum thing, but, but the musicians working together and that's what you're looking for. So any way that you can get this, you know, there's lots of techniques for doing this. There's lots of ways to, to make sure that people are aware of the tempo and the play to the tempo. I like uh, start with lower tempos don't do a really fast song and then don't try and take a slow song. They're just going to be horrible. You know, pay attention to tempos, bring tempos up throughout the day and you'll probably get better results. You know, wait, wait till after, wait till after dinner, go back down to tempo. It's a ballad right after dinner. Maybe, you know, you got to mm, tempo yeah. management. Tempo management is, is important, but it's only one aspect. There's lots and lots of aspects like this tempo, tuning timing wow. you know yeah and all these things and and you got to pay attention to all these things and you got to try and optimize them because you want them to just do it you want them to just go boom and play the fucking thing and then you go 
yeah, fucking great. Sounds fucking great. Don't have to do anything. I remember <laughs> after, after, you know, taking more than three, four, five, six, seven takes that you, that you go, Hey, let's go to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> let's go to the bar. Well, right well the, the thing, the thing is, you're fighting subjectivity all the time. So right. you, 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 the, the, the way to, the only way to get past that after you've done the song four times, you're really not hearing it anymore. Right. It's hard to listen to it. It's hard to play it. It, it just, the feel is not really there anymore. So what you want to do is go for a total change. And if, and if, you know, my mother used to say a change is as good as a rest. So the thing is to, just change the whole thing. Move to a totally different kind of song. Or, yeah, go go grab something to eat, come back. Just clear the brain out and then, you know, and start, uh, approach it again, you know. Because trying to, you know, madness is just doing the same thing over and over again and, you know, expecting a different result. So you do yeah. it three times. It, if it ain't working, you you got to change something. The, the yeah. best thing to do is change the atmosphere. Maybe it's too early in the day. You know, whatever. Maybe people hungry. Blah blah blah. You know, you yeah. gotta, and that that's a lot of that's a lot of thing too, because it's really herding cats, aren't you? So you, you know, you gotta, you know, you you, you gotta watch the human element and and try and get everybody in a good mood, and everybody happening, and you know, maybe they have a couple of beers or whatever, and you get them, you can get them back in, and then they can start to pick up on, you know, and and start to concentrate and just you know. You need to get them to the concentration point, and 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 then try and snap it real quick. You know, yeah. And that that that's the best way to make records. Of course, everybody makes records totally differently now. So yeah, everybody makes records I, by I, the, I, the, the yeah. Steely Dan way. You know, I have a question <laughs> about Dave Mustaine's vocals. His voice, much like a lot of the singers that you've worked with, uh, have an interest. He, he, Mustaine's is not really a crooner or a singer. How do you describe, you know, how you got what you got, which is probably the best you could get out of Dave at the time? Personally, before you answer, I like Dave's voice. I think it's very unique and no one sounds like that. And, and it's kind of a thing. And in a roundabout way, like Hen Henrik Ostergaard, Dirty Looks, and there's probably other others that aren't just coming to mind. You've recorded that sort of nasally kind of, you know, kind of you know what I mean? You're taking a, a, yeah. car, a cartoony sort of approach to these, this sort of bombastic thrash metal or just heavy metal or hard rock or whatever and creating something that works with the fucking song and that's all that's important but recording that can you imagine having to record lemmy's vocal it's just <laughs> it's just air over the mic you know you kind of like where's the tone in that but obviously the yeah. engineers that worked with lemmy they same question you see what i mean it's the same same kind of question if somebody else were sitting there that had done a lot of Motorhead records, what, what was it like recording such an interesting <laughs> a vocal approach with Mustang? Yeah. Well, you know, um, to me, uh, Dave is not really a singer, so it, it, it's more of a challenge. And he kind of readily admits that he's really not, not, not really a singer. It's sort of born of necessity, you know? Yeah. So, so that's that's very helpful because that means that I basically he's not going to be bashful or he's not going to be too worried, and basically I can say, okay, um, this is going to work, this isn't going to work, you know, blah blah blah. So uh, the first thing we did, we went through a bunch of different mics, and that's pretty much a standard thing with with any singer is I'll go through, I'll have a, a bunch of different mics and, and try all the different mics. And we ended up with a, actually an AKG 414 for Dave, which is actually unusual because it's quite bright. And I, it was the last mic that I thought would work and actually sounded really good on it. So I got to say that the first thing for any vocal is finding the right microphone. And if you find the right microphone, <clears throat> then... Uh, that was the first record that we did digitally uh, on a Sony 24-track digital on half-inch tape, tiny tape. 
Um, So uh, in that sense, you there's you, you don't have to do so much if you're recording analog you got to have a probably a compressor in the chain unless the guy is really on the on the on the mic properly and doing you know this kind of deal so um but with digital you can just turn it down and and you put a compressor on the output yeah. and, and and that's that's fine and you could don't have to mess with it and and that's good and the only other things that I would work Use in his vocal chain is a Massenburg eighty two hundred EQ, which all is of the audio, expensive. all of the audio nerds out there, they're gonna know all of the names of these gadgets uh, you're fucking yeah. talking about. Me and Dave don't yeah. know. I yeah, mean, yeah. I mean, exactly. I'm even in the biz and I don't know the fucking shit you're talking about. Doesn't matter. Yeah, but, well, they're, they're but very expensive. But just very, a couple of very expensive items that I would yeah. always use on his vocal. Yeah, the, and he was it was tuned, of course. Oh, well, you know, a little bit of that. You tuned my vocal a little bit. Yeah, that's it's right. No, it's normal. I, I feel like yeah. it's a normal thing. Uh, well. Because it, it, isn't it true? Like, let's keep talking about Dave. If he got the, f- I mean, if, if his performance on the mic in the studio was the shit and the energy yeah. and the fucking, ah, uh, was there, you keep that shit. Yeah, well, that's exactly it. And then you, and then if it's a little out of tune, you just maybe you just touch it into tune. So, the whole point about Dave's vocals is that it's a characterization. Yes, and it has to be treated as a characterization. So it's important that it's legible and audible, and and you can hear the character in the voice. So that that's important as opposed to like a rap vocal maybe where it's a kind of double tracked and sits back and, and is more of it just carries the tune and is less of a performance vocal. Dave's, Dave's vocal, most of these guys, <coughs> even Ozzy, Ozzy is always double tracked, but most of these, like Henrik, it's really performance vocal. Yeah. So with Dave, uh, the way that we would record his vocal is he would go probably most of the way through the song. And I would have four tracks and I would have a, 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 a marking sheet with the four tracks and the lyrics. And as he sings, I mark off what I got and I, and I see what I haven't got yet. And right, you're, so you're, you're comping the good shit. Yeah, I, I'm, but I'm not comping as we go. I'm letting him sing. Yeah, and then, and then, you, you, with it's different for every singer. You have to feel them out. Sometimes they want to go back, punch something. Sometimes they just want to sing the whole thing again. You also got to be real careful about the length of time that they're singing, and how hard they're working their voice, because singers, I found, can only work four or five hours before you really uh, might be in jeopardy of blowing the voice and you can't afford to do that. So you gotta, you gotta make sure you look after the vocal cords at all times. And for that reason, it's often a good reason to go to the back of the song, do the last choruses first, do all the choruses first where it's clear or do all the verses first but then the high ones where it starts to get a little raspy wait two hours where it's starting to rough up then go do the end course the middle course then you know you know you knowing how a, a voice changes throughout the session is also another key to doing vocal sessions i got a guy coming over in march or april and i'm probably going to be recording all the stuff and that's it's really a pop guy but we're going to be looking at lots of different microphones, ribbons and lots of different stuff. And, and we're going to be going through a lot of that kind of stuff. So it's very interesting to, and, and you, you, you can't fix the voice. If the guy blows his voice, you're fucked. Right. So you got it. So you always keep the rough, you always keep the rough vocal until you got another one that's better. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause all of this, the same with everything. You always keep the rough fucking solo as well, because if, you know, if the guy can't do it any better, this one's good enough, you know, yeah. or at least you got one, right? you know, that, 
you got to have it. You know, I mean, you can't produce a record if you don't have the bits. You know, so, so this is you know. this is more for this is more for Dave, and he may or may not have heard me tell this story, uh, especially with you in the room. Uh, so, so I remember we're, we, the toys are, we're recording vocals for tease and pleasing. Okay. And it's, I don't know what mic you've got, but I'm, I'm in the, I'm over in the room through the glass and I've got the cans on and the mics there, just normal day in a life of Joe Blow recording session. And I, I can't get the vibe of the song i don't recall exactly it could have been like the scat vocal part shubity mama to shubity mama to bullshit right could, yeah, whatever yeah. whatever yeah. it was i was like i had what i call demoitis where the demo was really badass and we're <laughs> and we're in the fucking studio with a name producer and i'm going some this ain't right this vibe this i can't i can't I should never say I can't. I'm working on it. But, you know, it just wasn't working for me as like where my heart wanted to go with that vocal. And I fought you a little bit about the idea of let me do it how I do it live. Well, that means one of these. This is an SM58, right? This is the weapon of choice in the normal everyday life of rock and roll. Okay. You finally broke and you said, okay, come in here. <laughs> and I thought it was the funniest shit. We don't have photos of this, but you had Bruce, the, the second engineer duct tape, the mic cable as I hold the yeah. 58 to my fucking arm, because you were worried about the cable sloshing around as I threw shapes, you know, rocked out. Well, you get, yeah. Well, you get, you get mic noise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mic noise but in did, the track. Yeah. Yeah. Did, well, you, I did that. We did that with that? Paul Rogers. That's why. I did, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's why I did it. Cause Paul Rogers, he, he wouldn't sing to a, to a mic on a stand. He wanted to hold the mic and he used a 58, but he took the ball off. Wow. And he and he and he was singing like this, and he's got great mic control. So his voice, yeah. the needle went to zero every fucking time. No wow. compression, nothing. Wow. And but when he moved the, around, it was you could hear it rumbling on the mic because yeah. of the cable. So we had to tape it here. That's so that's why I got that trick from. You could hear the. So bugs. that's why he did it. With, wow. You could hear the bugs. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Yeah. This is what I'm loving about this conversation. Like I'm, I'm picking up all these little things like, like Max was just saying earlier about record, record the, the tail end of the vocals first while the voice is still fresh. Cause at the end of the song, it's wearing out. So all these little tricks I'm, I'm finding fascinating. That's all. Fascinating. Yeah. I mean, if you, uh, yeah, I mean the, the tubes kind of did a lot of stuff like that. They, the completion backwards principle was one of their albums and, that's really the kind of principle behind a lot of stuff is that you have to think about the what you want and then just make sure you get there. And, and, you know, if, if you, it's a lot easier if you know what you want, obviously. So, yeah. you know, so it, it's important to, to understand the music. Of course, if you don't really understand the music or you don't like it, then there's really no point in trying to produce it or, or work on it. You know, I mean, it's possible to engineer it, of course, but, I mean, uh, producing something that you don't like is really a, a, not something that I've ever really done because I, I find it almost impossible, you know. Mm. And yeah, you know, obviously, yeah, Jace. I mean, there's, you know, there's there's going to be times, you know, I, I'm probably a lot more flexible about that these days than I was, but but you know, that's you know, good. Yeah. So I mean, but. Um, you At the you, end of the you, day, you you didn't like curse me out or you know tell me that that was we're not gonna fucking do that and walk, storm away and turn your back to me. <laughs> I, I was I was insistent, but I you could tell that I was I remember it well. Uh, I you could tell that I was upset, and and if and 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 you can tell me if the if the artist is totally upset. I mean, I was I was going into my own head. And it was bothering yeah, yeah, me enough yeah. to for you to understand. It's like, well, fuck it, let's let's give it a go and try it, and then and then. But 
folks, Tease and Pleasant's recorded with the same mic I'm using right now. It's re it's <laughs> recorded with the the dumbest, easiest, best microphone arguably out there. So and duct tape. Yeah. And duct tape. Well, I mean, look, obviously, you know, obviously in any session, the last thing that you want is an upset artist. You know, it's just uh it's really crucial not to never to get to that point. So one of the things about producing is you you got to really pay attention if and if you see this kind of things come into a head, you got to diffuse it immediately and just make people, you know. So one of the things is, you know, you always got to be prepared to try it, you know, yeah. unless unless it's, you know, unless it's really fucking bad and it's going to take ages. You know, if it's only going to take a few minutes and, and it's a stupid idea, you might as well try it. You know, yeah. remember the remember the, the way to get the running order of the album remember you yeah. should, you know you get you get all the guys to write out their running order and they give them all to me and then when you guys go i throw it away and write my own running order <laughs> but, but you guys you guys love the running order when but you know why because you think it was partly your running order you see so you know that's it, it's all a question of there's a lot of you know psychological stuff that sure you know you know look everybody knows it's slightly manipulative but it, it's you're in the street. I've got to get stuff done. So and any way that you can get the best out of the artist is, is a good way to do it, you know, and obviously you're not trying to, but like with, like with particularly difficult line in a vocal. Um, I remember with, I was doing a, a vocal for Grim Reaper, with Grim Reaper, yeah. Steve, who's, who's no longer with us, mm -hmm. but he's, he was a great singer. Yes. And there was one line in one of the songs, and I knew I'd heard him do it really good, and he just wasn't quite making it. So I'd give him, I say, "Hey, do me a favor, just punch this one line again for me." And he'd go, "Okay, fine." You know, so run it, and I'd run it, and he didn't quite get it. And I go, "Okay, cool. Now I'm going to go to the back end chorus." Or you said, you know, and I would keep him moving, and I wouldn't really let him know that that line I still needed it. But I would gradually, and I, that's that's one way to work with. Uh, singers as well is is you you get most of what you got and then you're looking at your chart and you're going listen i need i need a better one here see if you can get a better line for this one you know and and so some people work great like that some people only want to sing the song all the way through i think mick jagger only sings the song like three times all the way through mm -hmm. and then he goes and sits in the lounge and then he writes out the comp and gives it to you and then goes home <laughs> that's what i heard did I'm you like, ever, huh? you, you brought up something a minute ago. Did you ever get to a point in the studio where you pissed somebody off so bad that it, everything ground to a halt and just stopped? Um, no, I don't think so. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, um, I'm that's trying part, to think. That's part, no, of the art, that's part of the art of it, right? Is to avoid that. That's why you're so good at sort of hand holding and babysitting and, and prodding. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you try and avoid that. You, you know, you can't sure. let it get to that because it, it's too expensive, first of yeah. all. You know, and, and it, it, nothing, nothing good happens. There's nothing good about it. So, sure. you know, yeah. what you've got to do is, uh, it, it, you know, it, you have to try and judge people as early as possible and see where the boundaries are and see, you know, and see what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable, you know. Yeah. Uh, like, like I probably wouldn't tell Sting to put a modulation in the middle, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. <laughs> 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 but, but there again, I might, you know, if I heard it. Well, if you yeah. go, if you felt... probably go, shut up, you cunt, you know, but, yeah. but, but if you, know, you felt you like it, it, if you felt like it, it really needed it and he wasn't willing to at least try it. I mean, you have to probably also think it's fucking sting and he's great, but at the same time, why does this part keep haunting me about it needing the modulation or the, the slight change in the middle to lift yeah. the song up a little bit and him not wanting to do it or, you know, yeah, well, it. you know there there is that, and and you know what, you if if it comes back at you and it keeps coming back, then you, you can revisit it and go, listen, I I keep hearing this part. Yeah, uh, and that's... you look at them and you go, listen, man, I'm sorry, man, but I keep hearing it. Let's try it. Yeah, Honest. let's try it. Yeah. Let me you ask know? you. Let me ask you this: Have you, what album have you produced that you felt like 
you were firing on all cylinders. You thought you captured the best possible performance. You thought everybody was working well together. And then the album got overlooked for whatever reason. Do you have an album where you feel like all the pieces came together and then the world just kind of didn't pay attention to it? Well, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's plenty of those. Yeah. I mean, uh, but, um, uh, well, I thought that, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of it is about timing. And I thought that, um, when we did Lynch Mob, I was, I thought I was pretty on top of everything. Um, I thought I knew how to make good, really good records. And, uh, of course you're always learning, but at, at a certain point you think, you know, you, you're pretty, uh, you're pretty, you know, you're pretty capable of dealing with anything that's going to, you know, not make a good record. So, you you know, basically, again, you're just trying to get rid of the, the crap, right. you know, so that you don't end up polishing the turd at the end of the day, you know. So it's really self-preservation, a lot of it, yeah. so that you don't have to, you know. But the, um, I thought um, Wicked Sensation, I thought it was a great album, but there was it, it was right at the point where all the grunge stuff was coming out. And, and so that one, kind of got overlooked um i thought that uh, dirty looks on as a as a whole call from the wire and um you know all the other albums were pretty much overlooked uh, you know i don't know if that was just down to the fact of henrik n- not being out there enough or what happened but i know that atlantic weren't very uh, forward in helping them out or doing anything there's a there's you know. a story maybe you recall some conversation. Um, oh sorry no it's okay sorry, go ahead. Sorry. there there there's a story that you know because i'm in there i'm in that camp now so i'm hearing these really cool stories i'm getting to hear you know because i'm talking to jack pyers all the time now and <laughs> jack yeah, good old jack and yeah he's great and 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 he's telling me stories about him and henrik coming over he tells a story about how you were mixing the toys record and they dropped by the studio to hang out with you and and you played them the toys record, and so that Jack and Henrik, I believe, are just just by according to lore, uh, were the some of the first people you played that for, other than you know studio people and management and stuff. Uh, but but you know, it, it it's it's quite possible. I don't remember, but it's quite possible. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's it's interesting that 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 this one of the stories that I hear about the songs on Cool from the Wire is "Can't Take My Eyes Off of You," which was uh, the song the label wanted to be a single, and Henrik put his foot down and said, "No fucking way, we're never doing that song live. F- fuck you, blah blah blah," because it was kind of a ballad ish if, yeah. if there even was yeah. one on the cool record i don't think there is and you know what it's a great fucking song whatever but you don't remember anything any kind of like that song being haunted by oh you know it's a dark cloud over that subject no not okay. really i mean right. i like i liked all his songs <clears throat> i like tokyo and yeah, you know oh, yeah. all, i mean i i think they're very evocative and i think it was really a, really a good basic songwriter and and i thought his songs were really you know but i can't take my eyes off of you yeah. i know it, yeah it, it's good fucking one. great I, it sounds like it could yeah. have been like a frankie valley song or something it's, don't, don't, don't. yeah it's from yeah, one I, of those it's from it sounds like it's from it could have been like a cover of an old like 50s or 60s Na, 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 na. Yeah, I remember the verse. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, you know, all this stuff was very evocative and and very good. I, I, I think the. I, I don't know what really happened there. It was just like Henrik's his own worst enemy. You know, yeah. I, I don't know what happened. I mean, yeah. it, it just, he just pissed. He used to piss everybody off. I, and I, I don't know how he did it because I, I didn't see him do anything. But people would be pissed off at him already, and, well, you know, like the guys in the bar. You know? The the story <laughs> the story that Jack says that it is there there is truth too. The label wanted to move with eyes as a single, and Henrik was not having it. And I could be colorful here again, but not. It was, there was no fucking way it was even budging. As a matter of fact, he would probably have chosen to take it and trash it because they wanted it to be the number, the first thing out there. 
It's just oh, interesting how this all kind of works and the story. So that brings, yeah. <laughs> well, how, <laughs> how it used to work. Right. That, well, that, well, the, that the stories, a, the stories I hear as a fan are why are, you know, it's like, whoa, really? You know. Yeah. That brings yeah. up. I, a, I, that's a shame. It's a, it's a shame that, that Dirty Looks, I mean, I'm in, it's interesting now that so many people still like them, you know. I sure. mean, I, I, I always thought it was a great, you know, and when we were making those records, I really liked them. You know, yeah, man. You know, no brain, no brains, child. Yes. And, you know, I, I just thought they were all really, really just cool stuff. You know, you don't have and to I tell me. I, again. You don't have to tell me. I get <laughs> well, to sing. I get to sing that shit yeah. now. Yay. Yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> Rosie was a fucking tough one. He had to, we had to like sing it on two tracks because you know, well, yeah, that that's it because there's a lot of words going on there. You mean, and you I mean to, Ruby? You mean Ruby? Ruby, Ruby, Ruby. Ruby. Yeah, it's a easy faux pas there. Yeah, he, I, I always, I try, I always used to try and get him to sing like Bon Scott, because he could do the, he could do Bon Scott better than Bon Scott, mm-hmm. and he would never do it. And I, I, I think uh, Ruby is is the closest one I got, yeah. and only because it's in that register. But that, if you listen to that and think about Bon Scott, it's really, it's pretty close over there, you know. Some people yeah, think but, uh, that some people think he was doing Bon Scott the whole time, and you're telling me that he that he w- refused to do it, which is weird. Well, yeah, no, he <clears throat> look, he was aware of all the parts that he'd stolen from ACDC, because let's face it, there's a whole bunch of. You know, there's a little rearrangement and stuff going on, but a lot of that stuff is pretty generic, you know, kind of 12 bar, 16 bar, whatever it is. But, which you know. is which is the reason a lot of people like Dirty Looks is all of the things, those those comparisons, the things that are stolen, they better, as Paul Stanley used to say, if you're going to steal something, it better be a diamond. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So Jason brings yeah, up know. something. Uh, this Jason mentioned something that, uh, triggered a question in my mind did you ever work on an album and then when it was completed you just cringed at the lead single that the label chose to release to radio and you thought my god i just busted my ass on this album it had so many better <laughs> tunes why this that's a good one? question that's a real good question uh no i don't think that ever really happened to me but you gotta understand a lot of in the the period that i was doing it single well I, I suppose they were fairly important but it was really more about it wasn't just single it was also video mm. you know all the rest of it so it was, a, it was a little bigger than leading off with the first single and usually that had all been hashed out by the time you fucking got to mixing really i mean mm-hmm. people you know usually the a and r guy would be oh by the way you know oh so no that surprise. One, make sure that's a fucking good one you know or whatever you know mm. so You'd usually be, if it was coming from the record company, you'd usually be aware of it. But in some, in some cases, on some records, uh, you wouldn't have any idea what was going to be the single until you did the record. And then you'd be listening to something and go, oh, this fucking sounds, this song's working really well. Um, whereas other songs that you thought would be a single, you listen to them and they don't work that well. And they they just don't grab you, you know, so... There's a lot in the recording process that proves out whether the song works or not in real life, you know. In so, that scenario, in that scenario, how much leverage do you and the band have in choosing the single versus the record company back in those days? Like if if you were in the studio with a band and you heard something special and the band agreed with you that this is something special, do you do you have the power to overrule the record label if they're thinking, well, we got to go with the slower song. That's going to be the single. Uh, and it's you know that's a it's a it's politics really, and you know it gets into politics. And it, it's look, you you express your opinion whether they listen to you or not is up to them. That's that's it's it's out of my um, jurisdiction really. Yeah. Okay. So so so. I I would make a suggestion, sure. Yeah. You know, if they if they pick one I didn't like, I go that that sucks. Don't do that one. <laughs> whether, Here's your answer. Whether, and then you go home and hear it on the radio me, on the drive home. And they, and... You know, they do the same thing as the running order. They go, oh yeah, thanks very much for your input. Yeah. <laughs> and, do, and do their own, you know. So you know, I mean, look, you can always, you know, you go, like I said. The whole key to everything, the whole, the whole key to everything is trying to remain objective. 
then try and be truthful and try and see a way to make it better and just keep trying. And and hopefully by the time you get to the end of the song and you've got all the parts on there and everything's working, hopefully you got it right and, and everything's, you know, musically it's working properly and everything like that. I, these days, music has changed so much that now uh, you get like the symphonic bands, for instance, that appear to have no idea about dynamics at all because they have every instrument in all the time. Mm. And I don't know if you've ever been to see a big band or an old jazz band or anything, but a lot of these guys don't play sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, that's a very interesting thing. And if you talk to Chick Corea or you talk to any jazz person, they'll tell you that the silence is more important than what they're playing. And, 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 Nobody seems to be doing that anymore. If you and talk it, to Angus like, Young, he'll tell you the same thing. <laughs> well, yeah, these are like, this is an old school kind yeah. of deal, you yeah. know, whereas now everything has to be in all the time. But I think that's um, that's very non-dynamic to me. And, and I think it's uh, maybe it's due to everybody's social media and everybody has an attention span of about five, ten seconds, you know. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is, you know. Yeah. But uh, – <clears throat> yeah, but it seems to me that um, uh, the, I have the same problem with today's guitar players who are absolutely astonishingly good and and all kudos to these guys, but very few of them that actually speak to me musically. And, uh, I, I, you, I know, you know, I, I, and I can see there's a thousand Ingves, but, you know, there's only one Uli John Roth, for instance. Yeah. You know, so, so you know, yeah. the people that, you know, this is, to me, if you want longevity, it's not about how many notes you're playing, you know. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's really about how beautiful can you make this piece of music. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and that's, that's what people are, seem to be going past the musicality and into some technical realm, which is yeah. very, very fine and good, but that's, that's leave that for the practice room and come out and play me something tasty, you know? Yeah. I think, and music, we, you know, I, I think one of the reasons people love music so much is it connects with them on an emotional level. And I think it has a better chance of connecting with you on a, on an emotional level. If it breathes a little bit, if it ebbs and flows, if you're just being hit with an onslaught of notes constantly, you might be impressed with how many notes are going blurring past but it's not really the song. There's not a song in there. It's not connecting with you. And I think yeah, that people, I, I think people like the emotional connection to music. Well, yeah. And chicks don't like fast solos anyway. So you're much better <laughs> off, much better off doing and then the there's Mick, that. Yeah, the Mick yeah. Ronson or Pink Floyd solo than you are doing the Ingvae solo, you know? Yeah. Listen, what and do I, you, you know, I, I think it's disappointing because I think these guys are really terrific. And there's, there's a couple of guys out there like, um, Matthias, I can't remember the guy's name. There's a couple of astonishingly good players who are who have very good feel, and their timing is impeccable, and they play with real beauty, mm -hmm. and and they play astonishing stuff. And the, those guys, I think, are really fantastic. But there's lots and lots of guys who are just it's just a blur of notes, and it's not speaking at all. You know, thousands. Thousands yeah, yeah. of those guys. Yeah. I, I yeah. have, I, I want to switch gears because I, I, I'm getting hungry and it's almost time for fucking dinner. Yeah. So, <laughs> I've got listen, one last question. Yeah, I haven't, I hope this is not on, not your, it probably, this, this could be related to your list, but do you, what do you remember about Delirious Nomad? The Armored Saint Delirious record. Delirious Nomad. There you go. <laughs> good uh, hooks, man. Delirious Nomad, yeah, good. Uh, you know, another band, actually, that um, I was going to mention, Armored Saint, that was really ignored by the record company, Geffen, I think it was. No, and, uh, um, Chrysalis. Chrysalis. Well, Chrysalis, yeah, they were really ignored. Yeah, and but it, um, Kolodna was dealing with them or something. I guess mm. Kolodna worked at Chrysalis at that time. I mm. don't know what the fucking story was, but mm. then and then there was a whole big problem. Um, let's see. Okay, great guitar player, right? Uh, he's gone now. Dave, uh, yeah, David David Pritchard. Pr yeah. Dave Pritchard. Yeah, mm -hmm. really, really good player. Really nice guy. Very good lyrical player. Mm -hmm. um, Phil. Uh, Gonzo's San brother Sandoval. Yeah, 
Phil Sandoval, yeah, couldn't play, couldn't terrible player. So um, had to basically have Dave do his parts. Okay. And then uh, somebody from the record label got involved, and then they said, "Oh, we, you know, you should get rid of Phil because he's no good." You know, and I'm like, "Well, it's really not my place," you know. But oh, you know, anyway. So basically, Phil was out and didn't really play on the record, and. Um, which was something that I was never felt good about, but it just it wasn't really my decision that you know, and and you know it just made sense to have Phil do the parts because it was you know the, he was really struggling, and um, so <clears throat> it won't be the first time that anybody got substituted in the studio or the last. Right. But anyway, so I actually saw Phil not too long ago last year, and he still hates me. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, so I did. I did apologise to him too. I said, "Listen, Phil, I'm sorry." He goes, "Max fucking Norman." That's what he said to me. Wow. <laughs> mm. I'm like, oh, carry a grudge for long much, you know. Mm. But anyway, whatever. So I was, you know, I was apologetic to him. Listen, I didn't want to get involved with that shit. It came down from the other end. It just happened to be that, that I was in the middle of it, and I didn't want to be in the middle of it. Yeah. I love John Bush. I love John Bush. I love um <clears throat> I love Dave Pitcher's play and he was great. He was a great guy. It's really a shame that he's gone because yeah. he would have been a really good player by now, I'm sure. And he, he was a great player then. And um who else in that band? Um Gonzo. Gonzo and Gonzo is Joey a great, Vera. Gonzo and Joey Vera, a great mm-hmm. bass player. And, yep. and, and I, I love Joey and I love Gonzo. Joey's doing a lot of production there. He's, he plays bass in fucking eight different bands. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I love Joey. I think he's a great bass player and he's got a great stage presence. Gonzo's a great drummer. I mean, yeah. and John's, John still sings like a bird. He sounds terrific. You know, sounds you, terrific. Did you know, do you know about my 2022 at this point? run on the east coast i fronted I, armored saint i did hear about that yes you are just a you're just a chameleon of bring in the bozo you know bring in the no, second no, stringer no. you know <laughs> no 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 i mean hey I, all kudos to you i mean listen these are none of these are easy parts no, you know, and and but to, but you 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 could do it because you did it on you know you've done it with toys all this time you know yeah but you know I mean you know I, I listen I always thought you were you had great vocal qualities man so you know I, and I know that uh, one of the things that was uh, we were worried about I remember now we were worried about the fact that you were doing a little bit too much Axel. Yeah, we didn't want to go full on Axel. You don't go full yeah. Axel, right? I don't think yeah, anyone yeah. should go full Axel because they should let <laughs> Axel be Axel, right? That's right. But, but I, under- I know that that was a that was one of the uh, things that we were we were keeping an eye out for. Yeah, yeah, and the the red hair and the tattoos weren't helping me much. I <laughs> know, but I remember it was really great timing because we got we got MTV right when it came out. And uh, it was it was really terrific, you know. And I was always a kind of chagrin that uh, I didn't do another record. And I, yeah. I, I, you know, I told you guys, and I told Tim Heine, you know, you weren't ready to do that that next record, and because uh, I didn't think the material was ready, and and I still I, don't think it was I, ready. I, I agree and I still with... think you should have had me do it because <laughs> I wouldn't have let you record that shit. Yeah, I agree. So I agree <laughs> with I agree with you at least at least about eighty percent probably because no, I, that's, you know, listen, it's not a terrible record, but you know, no. I just I just think it could have been a lot better and it needed to be a lot better. And there was, I, there's I think a, that was there's a lot of fans that would argue with both of us until the cows came home about Hellacious Acres, that second record. Yeah. But us as a band believe it was even half baked. Like five or six of the tunes were strong, and they're still in our in our live set now. And the other half, I don't re- remember the titles. So yeah, it's one yeah. of those kind of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was Roy Baker did it, right? Roy. Yeah. 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 Um, but you know, I, well, he, I at least he showed up. Sometimes he doesn't show up. I heard <laughs> well, he, sh- he, he he showed up, uh, and um, you know, I feel like he he did his job and he did the best that he could. I feel strange saying that about his his uh, style because uh, of his pedigree, right? But at the yeah. same at the same time, his pedigree is. 
kind of unmatched. And at the same time, I just think that we had tones and everything was fine. We left and we came back and the record, the tones were gone and everything was swimming in reverb or something weird. And it wasn't mass. It was mastered too hot or something really happened in the, in the changeover. And that's, that's all there is to say about that. But God damn it, man. If fans will, will, fans will kill me for saying that shit. Don't talk shit about <laughs> Hellacious Records. Hellacious Acres is my favorite toys record. Well, that's it. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, no, no, you never get, everybody's not going to like everything. So, you know, yeah. things go up, that's things it. go down. So, yeah. but yeah, you know, but, uh, well, but as it turns out, that was a really bad uh, time for that kind of music anyway. So yeah. we started to, yeah. you know, started to get into, started to get into, um, you know, uh, the whole, the whole grunge thing anyway. So, well, it's, you know, inter it's interesting every, every, again, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's interesting that, you yeah. know, cause I feel like I have to say something that you felt like the toys for their sophomore release weren't ready because we felt the same way, but see, we were on tour and we were selling units and they wanted to pull us off the road when the number while the numbers were high and we didn't understand that as a company right as a as a as a as a tribe out at the time working and on the road and selling records are you selling records oh hell yeah you're selling records but you're and i hate this your window of opportunity is closing yeah it sounds yeah. bad i know yeah you know well the the problem this this problem is that you're not alone in having that problem the second record problem it's a well-known syndrome yeah. you know with, yeah. with a lot of bands because the first record is the best of, out of the last 10 years of fucking composing and then the second record is oh shit now i gotta write a shitload more because you use up all the best ones on the first record so you know which of it, course you're gonna do it so, happens yeah. you know yeah so now you you know you got a, a lot of work to do and you got to play catch up and unless you already have a, some stuff done then it's very difficult to come up with, you know, another album's worth of good material. It takes yeah. time and it needs to be sorted out. It needs to be uh, fixed or discarded or rewritten or whatever needs to happen to make them all, you know, good. And really in those days, you try not to make any filler tracks, you know, you try yeah. to, you know. Well, you it's, know. it sucks that, that that's, that it's very common that it, you know, some bands are, they don't really have the development or the, I'll just fucking say it, the stamina to, to be kick ass all the time. And it, and it takes a lot of work to understand what could be, you know, I sheepishly say that, uh, wrong with your second record, with your batch of songs, with your next batch and where you're headed and what, how are you going to grow? How are you going to kick the shit out of the record you just made? It's kind of a contest and inner conflict with your, your inner artist. And, and it's, it's not a fun war all the time. So. No, it's, it's very difficult. And, uh, especially when, you know, in those days, all the shots were being called by A and R people who, may or may not know what they were doing so you know they weren't necessarily experts some of them were very good but there were also people who weren't very good you know right. like Celine yeah. was very good A&R person yes. but you yes. know there's lots of other people that were not very good and and really didn't know you know what they you know just liked like to be in the music business or you know sure. whatever you know yeah but, but you know yeah but, you know yeah it's difficult and yeah, so, you know, yeah, you make some, but when you're making the record, you're really just trying to make the record as good as possible. You're not, you're not trying to make a hit record so much as, or you're not doing, you know, if you, if you try and second guess stuff and go, oh, no, it has to sound like this because this is current or this, this is, then usually it's a fucking failure, you know. I hate what you got to do is, yeah, you, you got to take the music and interpret it and let the music open up and, and, and let the music dictate how it sounds and, and, and not think about boxes or is this country or is this, you know, fucking, you know, black metal or is this, you know, you, you got to, people have all these boxes and the real good bands aren't in any of the boxes, you know, right. they, they have their own box. So, sure. you know, that, that's really the way to think about things and, and not try to, you know, just try everything and, you know, I'm, I'm 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 doing this pop record with this guy's coming in, uh, a Swedish guy, and uh, 
So that's kind of interesting because uh, uh, pop records, I think, need one thing in there that nobody's ever heard before, like a sound. You know what I mean? Yeah. They need like a, like, and if you listen to any ABBA record, there's always something in there that you go, what the fuck's that sound? You know, you know, it's like a little hooky sound thing. So um, I'm trying to work out, you know, maybe like, uh, I'm starting to think like uh, Trevor Horn a little more, like, you know, getting a little outlandish and, and doing sort of more crazy stuff, like a little Zapper-esque stuff and a little more like, yes, you know, only a lonely heart kind of, you know, there's these kind of, uh, these kind of things where there's like little hooky bits and all this kind of stuff. Because I like space in the music, and I think currently a lot of music has no space at all. And yeah. uh, I kind of miss the space. I like to have a bit of space. Yeah. 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 I have one last yeah. question, and if we could get just a real quick answer. Uh, it, it, here's Sorry, the question. I'm talking too much. No, no, that's You're quite good. all right. It's been fascinating. I, I've, I've loved every minute of this. But if we step outside of your body of work, and you look at other records, what album from a production standpoint is your holy grail? Which album out there do you think good, has, good one. is like the best, most well-produced record you've ever heard with your ears? Oh, I don't know. That's really difficult because there's so many, there's so much great stuff out there. Um, <coughs> I would probably break it up into different parts. I, um, Some, some, there's some, some parts of some records that are, that, are, that I just find amazing because of the way it sounds. Um, like the Paul McCartney "Tug of War," there's a there's a part on there with a with bass cello, where the bottom end of the cello is just absolutely sublime. It just it just sounds so good, you know. And it, the little things like that. So I don't think I have really a particular. You know, although there are some records that are very notable, like Crime of the Century, for instance, you know, what a fantastic record just all the way through. And, you know, it's just so well written. You know, some of the earlier um, Genesis records, you know, stuff like Selling England, to, like Selling England for the pound, you know, by the pound, these kind of earlier records. It's a couple of Cream records out there, you know, uh, You know, um, Axis Boulder's Love is also probably a, a, a really, really good record to, to look at for 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 just sheer beautiful guitar parts and, and just, just really good playing. It's probably the best that Hendrix ever plays as far as in, in you know, as far as playing normal kind of stuff, you know, yeah. but he just plays it so beautifully. You know, the way he plays Little Wing, these people doing Little Wing, shut the fuck up. And just listen to Little Wing, okay? <laughs> don't play it, okay? You know? Yeah, covering covering. <laughs> you know, Hendrix, I don't need to hear, covering don't need to hear Rob dangerous. Zombie doing fucking Little Wing, you know no. what I'm saying? No. You know, <laughs> you know. But, but, you know, <laughs> you know those, those are some fantastic records. But, you know, and, and, of course, some of the Led Zeppelin records that have been so overplayed now that almost unlistenable, you know, almost embarrassing to hear a Led Zeppelin record now because they've been played so much. <laughs> But really, I mean, if you want to talk sloppy, you've got Jimmy there. Jimmy don't give a shit. Jimmy plays it twice, picks one of them, walks out, you know. Yeah. He don't care. You yeah. know, because he knows. He knows. He knows people are going to like that. If people are going to hear that mistake three times, they're going to like it. Right. You know, that's why, you know, we always see if, you, if you're in the studio, and you're doing an overdub, and they sing the wrong part, erase it immediately. Yeah. Don't keep it. Just get rid of it because you, if you hear it three times, you're going to like it. Now you've got the wrong part. Then later on, you're going to go, oh, that's the wrong part. You go, wait, I like it though. No, no. Now you're stuck. Now, I'm, now you get, you know, demo artists, you know. Right. You got to be real yeah. careful about that stuff. You hear something two or three times, it's fucking in there. Well, you're that's, how, that's it. how it works. And I, I think that that organized slop that players have sometimes, I think that that becomes and and a, a signature and a sound to a thing and yeah you know i mean yeah, angus yeah, angus sure. young's angus young guitar solos in the old days i feel like we're like where he's just making the guitar go bing bang zing rah, zing, rah, yeah, 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 yeah. you know and they leave all that yeah, on the yeah. record i love that and i think aerosmith <laughs> yeah. did that uh, quite a yeah. bit, and they left it all yeah, in, yeah, and it yeah. became part of the song, and it gave them signature too. So, 
Uh, uh, it's not a, really an argument. It's just kind of, but it's interesting to hear your perspective on if you leave that, people yeah. are going to end up liking it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, there is, like, there's all kinds of little rules that they have like ignored, you know, avoid the obvious is one of the rules. And then the next rule is don't always avoid the obvious. Wow. You know, I remember uh, Alice Cooper one time saying, if you fall down on stage, fall down two more times and they'll think it's part of the show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's you know, kind of that's what it. you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's like if you must make a mistake with the bass, you know, you make it, you just play it again. You play it wrong twice. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's real. <laughs> Yeah. Max, this hey, has been amazing. I mean, what an education on, and what a career you've had. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm looking I at my record. Too much bullshit, that's what it- no, I, I loved every bit of it. I'm looking at my record collection over here, and and uh, me and I'm sure a ton of our listeners and viewers owe a great debt of gratitude to you and your work because I know we all have your albums in our collection, and uh, and they're great and they've stood the test of time. So. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, I'm I'm surprised, really. I didn't figure they would last this long, but I guess you know it worked out okay. But uh, oh yeah, I would. You, you you never think at the time, you know. We didn't think when we were doing dangerous toys, you'd still be out there doing dangerous toys now. No, we had no idea. It's fleeting moments. We didn't know if the fucking thing was going to set sail or fucking yeah, sink, yeah. right? Well, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, yeah. the thing is, is is now, and uh, before we let you go, I, when I listen to, you know, some of the records of the time between 87 and probably, you know, 95 even, I hear Max Norman drums, I hear Max Norman guitar and I think about uh, the sessions we had, and I I feel like yeah, I can like see the guitar, I can see the drum, you know. Uh, so you you have your signature on a lot of stuff that I feel like our listeners, if they if they really listen to. Cool from the Wire and the debut Toys record and and you know Euthanasia and whatever, they're gonna hear your snare drum and your guitar and you're the way you did it for a fucking reason. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, I just make it so that I like it. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. I go, no, I don't like that. Well, that, yeah, I like that. So that's yeah. that's it. That could go back to Chris Angridis, you know, when he, hey, why don't you go have a chat with those guys? And then you change all the (laughs) faders and (laughs) act like you didn't do anything. I I know. I know. That was, I, you know, it it was a bit of an underhanded thing to do, but, you know, the, 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 I couldn't stand it, you know, uh, I couldn't do anything else. I was not really, I'm not really seeing it that way. I'm not really seeing it that way. (laughs) I think that you were part of the process. Is all that's it. Yeah. Just part of the yeah, process. Yeah. Time is money. Thank you for being yeah. here, Max. Thank you so much. I have so much. Oh, love we'll have to re- do some more. Yeah, we'll have to we do some more. We could talk hours, right? Uh, I just <laughs> yeah, have, yeah, have yeah. so much uh, respect for you and love for you and great, oh, great thanks, memories. I, I learned so much. Yeah, it's great to see you. I, yeah. I haven't seen you for many, many years. Yeah, well, you should be. You should tell me all about what's going on. But we'll do that another time. Yeah, I we'll guess. do it another time. I wanted to say I feel like I'm a better artist because of you, and I uh, appreciate oh. that. How to put together songs, really? I feel like I learned <laughs> a lot from you back way, way, way back then. That was another. Well, damn, know, that was all... another damn your old joke, by the way. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, you know. So yeah. you, you know, you you try and you learn. And the, the best place, the best place to learn is in the studio, actually, yeah. you know, and you can directly hear what's going on, you know, oh, yeah. and, and that there in the studio or pre-production. I mean, it really is a, a great place to learn. And, you know, uh, everybody learns. I learn all the time, too, yeah. you know, and you don't learn much if you're sitting on your own. But if, you, if you're in a room full of people and you and you and you get the track together, then. You know, it's it's good, and you can really generate that extra magic. That's that's what that you know, and there's no way to. You have to just try and guarantee that as much as possible, but there's no way to know whether that's going to happen or not. But well, it's you know, important. You just, it's yeah. important to listen and take some of that home with you, and I believe that me and the toys guys did. So I, I've I'm forever yeah. in your debt in debt for that. So it's pretty yeah. awesome. 
Thank you. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> Max, yeah. thank well, you. Well, you're most... welcome. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, we had a good time, so yeah. we had fun. And no, it, it was a good record. So yeah. Max, thank you so much for your time. It was a real honor and a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, like I said, uh, oh, yeah. got all your, I've got most of your albums, and 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 I love every one of them, and I still listen to them to this day. Some of them are. Oh well, I, I got a, I got, I got some so a new album coming out of, from a band called The Watchers. I don't know if you heard their last record, which is real mm -hmm. good, but uh, yeah, this one's coming out in a couple of months. Uh, this one's called. I forget what this one's called. Oh, it's called uh, Nyctophilia. So you can keep an eye out for that. I'll do a okay. video for it pretty soon. But uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty decent. Actually sounds real good. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, it's, so it's... I've been doing some mixing, but not that, not too much stuff. I'm I'm about to. I just finished this studio. So well, it's almost finished anyway. So um, I'm about to get back into it. And this is like an Atmos room. So I'm going to be doing some Atmos mixing soon. <laughs> so we'll see how we we'll see how that turns out. Well, if that's a fucking flash in the pan, you know. We're we're glad to know that you're still at it because you are a master of your craft. So uh, oh. thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. On behalf of my co-host Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with our very special guest today, Max Norman, on the Talk Louder podcast. <laughs>